started, I'm going to just reiterate, which we have tried to pass on to everyone, to please turn your computers off. Because we have a special demonstration that um, we're working real hard to bring to you, and that, that will help us do that. On behalf of the University uh, Board of Curators, welcome to Springfield and our September board meeting. While Springfield may not be the board's normal stomping grounds, we're thrilled to be here and visit with new faces. For those who could not make the trip with us, however, this meeting is being live audio streamed, and those interested can follow us on Twitter at UM Curators. I'd like to apologize yesterday if you were on the web stream with the compensation committee. It did not work, but you can go to the website and download the entire meeting. So for all of you, those people who are listening to us today who are disappointed that you didn't get that committee meeting, know that it is still there for you. The University of Missouri may not have a, a campus here, but our presence is most definitely felt. As we saw last night, the extension mission of the university is thriving in this part of the state. In fact, extension agents in Greene County presented more than 200 different programs to Missouri citizens in 2009. The University's Small Business and Technology Development Centers, located on the Missouri State campus, helped create or retain more than 1,500 jobs. And entrepreneurs and business owners in Greene County alone reported a $15 million increase in sales and the startup of seven new businesses as a result of the services provided by the University's Extension Business Development Program. With success like this, there's no doubt the university is advancing in all four corners of the state. Similarly, the university's e-learning initiative also knows no geographic bounds. As I have mentioned throughout my time as board chair, e-learning represents a major step forward in enhancing accessibility for today's students and redefining the way they learn. It is a continually developing paradigm that shifts the emphasis from traditional classroom learning to the robustness that can be gained when students have exposure to a wide well of tools and online resources as part of their learning curriculum. While a reliance on the internet may seem counterproductive to some of us, perhaps we think of it as a distraction, for today's students, it opens a world of learning possibilities. Let me say that once more. A student, anywhere, at any time, can have access to an array of resources that links them to a world tailored around them and what they are learning. Not only does this revolutionize the fully online classroom, but it also has the potential to positively affect classroom and hybrid classes as well. Now, special today. To illustrate how this works, we have two guests with us today. Rocky Keel is a teaching professor in sociology at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and he's also one of the university's e-mentors. He uses numerous modes of teaching, including face-to-face, -face, online, synchronous, asynchronous, individual, and group, to allow students to learn on their own time and in their own way while still providing a structure for consistency and community. Rocky will be coming to us live in St. Louis via WIMBA. Following Rocky, we'll hear from Zach March, the university's director of e-learning, who will be demonstrating a problem-based learning module that will give us a first glance of how students can interact on a one-to-one -one basis with the information they're learning. Rocky, welcome. Hey, Rocky, go ahead. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, thank you, Curator Haggard. Uh, although my name is Robert, I actually do go by Rocky, and uh, I'd like to give you greetings from St. Louis. I'm here with a number of people from the UM Online Initiative, and we're going to both talk a little bit about Wimba and also give you some demonstrations of what it can do in the classroom. You can see the folks down at the bottom of your screen and follow their text chats while I talk. Wimba is a pretty cool program. It's actually a set of different applications that include everything from podcasting and, and text chatting to voice email and voice discussion boards. 
Today we're going to talk just a little bit about the one I use most often, and that's the online classroom. And as you can see, the online classroom provides access to all the applications that uh, make a real class possible. Um, I like to do a variety of different things with Wimba Live Classroom, and you can see a list here of the various kinds of applications uh, in which you can use it. Uh, I use it most frequently as a way of capturing the class experience for online students. We also use it for virtual office hours and for review sessions. I actually have a picture here that I'm going to call up um, of me in the classroom to kind of give you a, a sense of what that's like for my students. Um, I like to get out and work the room, so to speak, and so I'm out there with my students. I have usually in this class, my introductory sociology class, a uh, 100 or so students in the classroom with me. Uh, my TA sits up on the stage behind the podium and works the computer. He can then also communicate with the students who are live online with us, just like you are. Um, and I have a web page showing, and we uh, go through my lecture notes or visit websites to uh, focus on topics and themes that are part of the class for that day. The other thing that's very uh, nice about the Wimba classroom is that we can record the whole event, which I'm doing now. You might have heard uh, Wimbalina at the very beginning of the, of the presentation telling me the archiving was started. And then we make those recordings available for students who have time constraints and can't actually be with us live. I'm going to give you a, a quick sample here of the application sharing. Uh, it's a great program that allows me to actually uh, share any application that I have open on my desktop. Um, and since most of my lecture notes are online web pages, that's what I most frequently share. Um, and I'm just going to take us over to the, my class uh, Blackboard site. Um, and if somebody can give me a green check mark and let me know that that's showing, great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm in the assignments area of my, uh, my introductory sociology, my gateway site, we call it. I'm not going to give you all any particular assignments or tests, but I'm going to show you one of the things that my students really love to do, um, and that's to work through quizzes in the classroom. Um, and it's a little application called StudyMate, and you can create quizzes, and I'll call one up here for you. Um, you can see that you can do just a standard quiz. You can set up a challenge that would be between two people or two groups, and that's what we oftentimes do in the classroom. We pit the students in the classroom against the students online. And the students can even download these quizzes onto iPods and other mobile devices so that they, they can study uh, just about anywhere they are. So let's open up the quiz, and we're going to see how well my friends from UM Online can do. Uh, this is a quiz on socialization. And so the first question is, children shape. I've got to move this a little bit, I think. Get it aligned on the screen for you. Children shape and form their attitudes, beliefs, and behavior based on cultural messages they receive from whom, Wimbians? Getting a lot of D responses, so I think we'll go with D and see if that's right. And that is right. All of those groups and agencies are considered to be primary agents of socialization. Here's another question. Let's see if you can get that correct, too. Bob is on a first date with Mary, whom he really likes, and he tries to act in a manner that will cause her to like him, too, and want to go out with him again. What would this be an example of? Idealization of the other, face work, impression management, or role-taking? Seems like everybody's choosing C, and we'll see if that's correct as well. Sure enough, it looks like you all have been doing your studying. And this comes out of the work of a very famous sociologist named Irving Goffman, whose work focused upon what is called the presentation of self. Um, so that's a, a real quick overview, a real quick uh, demonstration of what we do in the classroom. My students really like this, uh, um, the quizzes, so we can talk about themes and topics and uh, kind of do many lectures in between the questions. And I guess I would ask if anybody has any questions for me. Any, any questions for Rocky? If not, I will say thank you very much for allowing me to join the, the session this morning. 
And uh, I hope to see you all sometime in one of my classes. <laughs> all right, Rocky, thanks so much. You're very welcome. So that was a great example of how the technology is bringing students that are at a distance and face-to-face -face together in one environment. So Rocky has 100 students face-to-face, -face, about 60 or 70 at a distance. They can, they can come in together. So they can come together into one location. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is, is a problem-based learning module <coughs> excuse me, that were built for the faculty at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Mizzou. And what, what the, the format it's going to walk through is, is uh, it's really twofold, is that it's a faculty development module for the, for the faculty to get a feel for what a problem-based learning uh, module or course would look like. And the second part of that is how the students interact in such an environment. So the, the first step, or the tool we're going to use here is called Blackboard. And Blackboard is the course management system that all four campuses have. And in fact, it's used predominantly across the nation. It is the, by far the, the most used course management system. So one of the first steps that the instructor does in a problem-based learning class is to set the stage. He, in this point here, that's a Tennessee walking horse that has, um, that has a, some type of problem. And that's, uh, he sets the stage for the students of what the expectations are going to be, how they're going to be graded, and what tools they're going to be using. But what's nice about this tool here, too, is that they can also integrate video. So I'm going to play a short video of a horse that has, a, that has an injury, see if you can determine the injury, and then we're going to follow the case through and see how the students do. A five-year-old Tennessee walking horse mare is presented to you for lameness evaluation. Until three weeks ago, the horse lived on pasture with six other horses. The owner first noticed the lameness three weeks ago and has kept the horse in a stall since then. Over the three weeks, the lameness has increased, and the owner is concerned because the mare has developed the gait abnormality shown in the video. The physical exam findings are as follows. Lame at a walk on the right hind. Moderate swelling in the plantar aspect of the metatarsal region. Shoes on all four feet are loose, and heart and respiratory rate are mildly increased. Okay, so that's, uh, there's more to it, but that's kind of gives you the, the, the gist of what, what that ex experience is. That's really the physical exam that a veterinary student does, or a, a practitioner does, whenever they have a patient come into, into the clinic. Okay, the next part we're going to move to is the discussion phase of this. So the students have uh, the basic information in front of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And now we're going to use a tool called a wiki. And what a wiki is, is a, it's an environment that students can interact with each other, and they can also interact with the professor. Okay, so here the professor is in, in the black underline. He throws out the question, discuss the primary gait abnormality of, that you observed in the horse. And you'll see the paragraphs. You may not see the detail of, of the paragraphs, but the different colored paragraphs are different students' responses. Okay, so Holly's the purple, and Kyle puts a comment in and Riata Files and in Kyle. So it's, it's a discourse that's happening with the students. It's really a wiki. It's like a face-to-face -face conversation only online. So they work through some of that initial issue, and now the instructor just kind of lays back a bit and lets the students build that, that knowledge base. And then he comes in and says, hey, you guys are doing, you're off to a great start. What diagnostic imaging and tests should you consider? And then further down, Kyle says, we need an ultrasound, and Riata says, we also need radiographs. So they're going to go request those, those films. So now we're going to jump out of Blackboard for a minute and go look at the patient data. This is in an application called, uh, I have to log in real quick. called Explana, and it's a product that we're investigating to see how we can integrate this into our, into our curriculums. So here, the, the instructor has put all the videos and media that are associated with this case in this one location. So this is the presenting video we started to look at. Here's the radiograph that re we requested. So they can get a nice view of the, of the foot, our hook. The, these other three are ultrasound views. And we'll look at a microscopic slide that they also uh, requested. So the slide here, it's, it's, a digital, it's a regular slide that they've, they've scanned. 
and digitized. And now you can manipulate this slide by zooming into it. I can move in to different layers of magnification. It's really like looking at a microscope through the objectives of a microscope, and you're zooming in by different, by different levels of objective. I can move it around the stage just like you can in a microscope. So it really simulates that environment for the student. You can see wow. as it zeroes in and zeroes in. So now the students have the basic information about the case. They've got the, the, uh, the data about the case. Now let's jump back into the wiki. We'll see what that discussion, how that discussion entails. This one here, I'm just going to skip it. This talks about their interpretation, what they, what they found in that, in that presentation. We're going to jump to the treatment option wiki. Okay, as a, as a group discuss what are the treatment options, advantages, disadvantages. And again, this discourse starts to happen between the students, much like we did at the beginning. But what I want to show you that's different on this one, what's nice about a wiki is that you could insert, students can insert other media into that. Okay, they can go in and they can put uh, radiographs, or they can put images, they can put movies, they can put sounds, but they can also link to other locations. So here Holly says, hey, uh, I think corrective shoeing may be our best option for treatment. I found an article that might, might help. So they can go and link. They're linking out. It just happened to be an extension article that uh, one of the uh, former faculty members at the vet school produced, and they get some background information on the, uh, on the disease or on the symptom. Down here at the bottom, treatment, corrective shoeing is helpful. Oh, well, let's go look at that a little further. The next one, Tim goes, hey, that, that was helpful. I found one from a farrier organization. A farrier is a, a person who puts shoes on a horse. And so they give a different perspective, more from the practical side of the person that's actually going to be shoeing the horse. So that's a nice perspective to also have. Lastly, the, the last conversation here is from Riata that says, hey, we have to do a presentation and we need three peer-reviewed journals to put along with our, with our presentation. So she went out and found a, an article on PubMed. PubMed is a, a medical uh, database of, of, uh, of, of articles. And she found a great article that is exactly what the problem is on this horse. And there's the last one I want to show you here is he also says, hey, be sure and look at this figure one. It really shows the problem that this horse has. And we'll jump out to this image. And now we can see the deep digital flexor tendon is the damaged part of it. And it's the orange band here. That's the one that failed as that hoof broke down. This is the, the tendon that has stretched or ruptured. So as you can see, it, <clears throat> the wiki of, uh, and uh, the problem based learning format can really pull together a lot of elements, a lot of media elements into a rich environment for the students to interact with. Now what we saw here, we saw everything in one time. It, this is a bit staged. In a, a normal environment, you'd only see one wiki, then the instructor would introduce the next wiki and the next one and the next one, so it builds off each other. The way we have it set up today for pre presentation purposes, it's not quite accurate. And then they finally say, what's our final treatment rec recommendation? They went with the corrective shoeing. Let's take a look and see how they did. The treatment option that was chosen for the Tennessee walking horse was corrective shoeing. As you can tell from the video, the coffin joint does not subluxate as the mare walks, which means less pain and less chance for arthritis development in the coffin joint later on. By shifting the angle of the hoof with the corrective shoe, you have greatly reduced the tension on the damaged deep digital flexor tendon. Basically, they put a high heel shoe on the horse, okay? It just changed the angle of, of, that, of that hoof. And we've actually done this on some of our horses, and they do heal from this. It is a long uh, heel period. It's about six months to make that work. Now, the last part of this would be an assessment. So we've gone through the case. They've got all the information. They made the correct diagnosis. They made the great treatment plan. So we look at quick assessment of what we can do. I'll just show you some of the capabilities within a, an exam that's you probably couldn't do in a face-to-face -face classroom with paper. With your pointer, click on the navicular bone. I'm going to select it right there. That's, that's the bone that's in question. I can do a fill-in-the-blank, a multiple choice. These are pretty standard questions, but it's nice to see the radiograph so that's a real authentic assessment of the, of the problem. I'll go ahead and grade it. And I'll give you my feedback immediately how I did. 
I got one out of three. Obviously, that didn't answer the question, but it tells me this isn't in the vicule bone. That's where I selected it. So I hope this, this gives you an idea of how dynamic an e-learning environment can be, especially in a problem-based learning uh, environment where you have all this rich media that you can interact with. Any questions about what I presented? Yes? Assume the students have a class time where they start wherever they are, dorm, home, whatever. Yeah. Everyone gets online at the right time. The, the instructor controls the conversation so forth that you would normally have in a classroom. <laughs> Not necessarily. It depends. Sometimes, like Rocky, will have a live component and he has a, an asynchronous component. So a lot of times it's more asynchronous where the students can come and go as they wish. Now, they all start the class at the same day and they all have to end the same day and they all have to kind of follow through the same path. But I may look at the material at 6 in the morning before I go to, go to class or go to work. Someone else may look in the evening. There's this different time flexibility in that scheduling. So this interchange between students that we see up there in text may happen over a 12-hour period exactly. as opposed to an hour Live. But it could say, hey, let's everybody meet in the wiki room at 10 o'clock. We'll have this discussion. It could just as easily happen right then. Or it could happen over a 12-hour, 12, 12 24-hour period. If they do that, is there an opportunity for an oral discussion, or is it always in text? Great question. So at Wimba, that Wimba tool that Bob Rocky used, that's when the instructor would pull that up. He'd go, okay, let's go into a Wimba classroom. We'll have a conversation. We'll all be able to talk about this case at one time. So it's really like having a face-to-face -face dynamic talk. Good question. Okay, I think Steve had a couple questions or a couple comments. No, I was just going to, Zach's going to take a second to break down. I think it just gives you an illustration. Here you go, you want to talk about this? Let me talk while you're doing that. Okay. You want to say something? No, go ahead. Okay. Just want to um, re-emphasize this was a live demonstration of what's out there and how we can touch more people's lives. Certainly as we talked, I heard it two or three times yesterday. The number of people who are out there in our state who have hours but don't have degrees, how do you reach them? How can you reach them? This is a great example of how we as a university can go out there and touch these people, get to them, meet their needs, get a degree, get them back into our economic uh, development of the state by providing good jobs and having the right skills to do the jobs that we need to be working on for our state. So thank you very much. And I thank everybody here for turning your computers off. That made it work. It didn't work good yesterday, but it works great today. Call on the president now for his report. Good morning. Sorry, we're uh, running a couple minutes late this morning. John and I were over at the uh, Springfield's version of their civic council meeting. We had about 40 or 50 of their uh, civic leaders had a chance to stop at the University of Missouri and had some great questions, so we got caught up a little bit in the uh, Q&A period, so sorry we're a few minutes late. Um, I've got a number of topics to cover this morning, and then we'll have the chancellors come up in alphabetical order, and uh, we'll be followed by uh, Dr. Hal Williamson, who will provide the annual University of Missouri uh, health care update, so we've got uh, I think some good items to cover. I'll hit three items very quickly. Um, first of all, just a brief snapshot. We've been talking about our presence in Springfield in the region the last couple of days. I'll show some statistics about that. Talk again about the governor's challenge. Uh, we talked about that yesterday at lunch, but for the larger benefit this morning, talk about that and then update on a couple of items, including our shared service center project. Uh, first of all, in Springfield, you know, our presence obviously statewide. We saw that last night at Mount Vernon and our research facility, but, um, you know, we are uh, a very significant presence this morning in the group of 40 or 50 community leaders, uh, probably well over half had some uh, University of Missouri affiliation one way, shape, or form, a lot of interest in what we're doing. Dr. Williamson with uh, St. John's and Cox, uh, Leo Morton, a lot of interest in our joint pharmacy program, so very tuned in to what the University of Missouri is about. So I won't go through these uh, statistics, but certainly to say uh, and if you had a chance last night to look at the posters that were on display at Mount Vernon, um, a real uh, uh, interesting thing that Chancellor Deaton and I saw a few weeks ago in Columbia is the uh, way extension has evolved, particularly around small business economic development. And I used a statistic last week at the Governor's Economic uh, Summit in Kansas City to talk about one job being created for every $250 that's invested via those small business uh, development centers, which I think is a, a great investment. In fact, I as I was preparing for that speech, I kept looking at the $250 and thought it was a misprint, but to verify, no, it was $250, a job can be created. Next turn. 
Yesterday we um, talked a lot about the governor's challenge, and, and we did that because uh, it, it is uh, very important and significant for the state, but also will represent some real um, resource challenges for us over the next few months as we uh, meet some of those early on deliverables. Uh, we talked about attainment, so I won't belabor that, and I think the chancellors did a great job yesterday talking about some of the activities that we've had underway to, to do that. The uh, big resource issue will come in this notion of program review, where the expectation is that's been set by the coordinating board for a number of years that we will be producing for each uh, bachelor's program uh, 10 degrees a year, uh, each master's program 5 degrees a year, or each uh, doctoral program 3 degrees a year. So we now have uh, for each campus where we are against that dimension, and uh, we'll be reporting back uh, to the governor's office over the next couple of months about uh, where we are in that examination, uh, why some programs that may be producing few degrees yet may be providing a general education uh, framework across the campuses in order to, quote, justify those degrees. But I suspect that unlike our centers and institute discussion over the last few years that we will find some programs as a result of this review that we will uh, put under a, a bigger microscope. So I don't think there's a specific expectation by the department uh, or by the governor for how many programs fall out, yet the fact that we're doing a review uh, should have the necessary cause and effect. Collaboration, uh, Steve Graham is doing a, a great job leading this across the four-year public institutions and the community colleges. You heard some examples of that yesterday. There will be, again, an expectation that uh, we find ways of collaborating at the faculty level and the course development level to do that. The governor talked about funding, uh, and I talked a little bit about that yesterday, and clearly the notion of something more uh, predictable, uh, we would certainly aspire to. How we go about uh, designing that uh, is to be determined, and certainly uh, our role in economic development has been important. Just a, a quick note or two on economic development. We continue to um, really, I think, make very good progress more and more. I think the faculty are seeing that we are trying to clear out some of the uh, bureaucracy and, and some of the layers that have perhaps constrained that, uh, you know, whether uh, from a perception or reality in the past that's been there. And so we've tried very hard with uh, the system resources and with the uh, campuses to kind of clear that out so the faculty have a clear opportunity to uh, participate in intellectual property uh, development, uh, collaboration, commercialization, and so forth. Uh, so you can see that uh, we will begin what we announced earlier this year as of October 1st, taking applications for the Enterprise Investment Fund. Uh, this has created, uh, as you might imagine, a lot of uh, interest and, and maybe even excitement in terms of supporting companies that want to come to Missouri, use our university research to help uh, create jobs in Missouri, which should be, again, a very important opportunity for us. Uh, we've talked about the Fast Track Faculty Awards a little bit around this last discussion around e-learning, and certainly our research board awards have been an important part of that. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we received uh, something that we think is very significant, and we talked about it yesterday around economic development, and this is for the um, new market tax credit status being awarded to the university as a statewide opportunity. We don't know the total magnitude of that, but we've worked over the last six months to apply for this federal program that would allow us, uh, for example, to uh, perhaps build non-academic buildings so we don't have a uh, necessary opportunity there, but uh, you know, incubators, those that have been in our research parks, uh, examples like the Truce Project in Kansas City, New market tax credit could provide up to a 30% uh, discount for developers that come in using that vehicle. And so this is something that we'll certainly want to take advantage of over time. Uh, just this past week on another uh, economic development point, we received a notification from a large national foundation that our student IP uh, decision that we made last year uh, will receive a national grant from this foundation. Uh, so this is where we recognize that the students as they develop the IP uh, on our campus, uh, I mentioned this last week, the Governor's Summit. Uh, we are getting some national recognition for that, and we'll publicize that uh, with that foundation at the right point in time. Let me uh, talk quickly about our shared services project. You know that we've been working on this in earnest over the last six months. Uh, we finished uh, last week with a uh, near final report from our uh, consultant, as well as for the team that's been working on that. As a reminder, uh, this was the scope of that project. We wanted to look at the most frequent uh, back office processes within the university to see what were the opportunities for us to look at a, a shared service, a more efficient environment, and obviously with quality as part of that discussion. So that became the array of activities, principally around uh, human resources, finance, 
uh, procurement and IT information technology. Our timeline, uh, we've been working in earnest uh, since March. And again, uh, I will give a lot of credit uh, to Paul Toller. Paul was the uh, leader loaned to us from the uh, Columbia campus to lead that activity. Gary Allen, uh, Betsy Rodriguez, uh, and Nikki Kravitz provided the functional leadership in addition to a, a system-wide uh, campus group of functional leaders, including several folks that are in this room this morning. So again, a great collaborative effort. Next page. The goal, as you recall, was to evaluate our data. We've got a very uh, large spend uh, that is in, that's represented in that back office, meaning the non-faculty uh, part of what we do. So we wanted to look at our data and understand how that data compared uh, with other functional processes, whether it was comparing university to university, uh, which there are few that have gone through this process. So there's not a lot of data, but there's an incredible amount of data at the process level for corporations or other public entities that have gone through at the transaction level. So I think one of the things that we did accomplish here that you can reduce these transactions kind of to the lowest common denominator where it kind of takes the debate out of, well, we're different. Uh, when you get it down to a transaction, whether it's a payroll process or closing the books from a financial process, uh, that could be the same at the university as it could be at General Electric, as it could be at uh, any of your entities around the table. So I think that was a major part of what we were able to ultimately conclude. Obviously, we want to identify opportunities to lower our cost. And obviously, there's always a cost to achieve that, so we've got to be sure we're not uh, kidding ourselves about how complicated that would be, and certainly to improve service. And we talked about we engaged Accenture and Hackett to, uh, to help us in that regard. The uh, major findings is, uh, again, some of these were not surprising, but some of them actually, uh, based on my having gone through this a few times, were surprising. We have uh, low unit cost uh, of what we do, and this is because we uh, have, uh, in most cases, a lot of our transactions being performed by clerical staff that are paid, relatively speaking, very low. So at that level, not unexpected. Uh, what we do have, though, which is a bit counterintuitive, uh, is that we have very high volume, very high volume across our process. So we've been very distributed historically. Uh, we may have 150 people involved in, in a payment process as opposed to a fewer people. Uh, so when we do that over time, absent uh, more perfect policies and procedures, we create very high volume of transactions. And thus, when you look at what we do as a university at a process level, while we have low unit cost, we end up having high processing cost. So it's kind of a mouthful, but when you dissect this on, on the processes that we typically look at, whether it's order to cash or processing payroll or hiring, when we look at it at the process level, we end up having high processing costs, thus the opportunities that we saw here. The third finding is that while we've deployed a lot of IT capability and, and many more projects that are in the works, which I think bode well, uh, we aren't yet fully deployed, and in some cases, some of the technology that's been deployed is not fully utilized, uh, particularly in some of the self-service capabilities that go along with that. One of the obvious ways of reducing cost is to transfer some of that responsibility, which is a double-edged sword, from uh, a clerk doing it for a team of people, and that could be faculty or staff, and having the individual uh, provide some of that transaction support. To some degree, that's that's moving the cost around, and in other, other cases, that can be a more efficient way of doing that. The question, obviously, is do we have opportunities for cost improvement without cutting service? And that, that will be the, uh, uh, the issue that is dealt with. And at the same time, we've got many areas that, as our users got involved in this, uh, we need to improve service. Uh, a lot of dissatisfaction. In fact, I just had a letter from an employee this week about dissatisfaction about some of our human resource processing at the payroll level because of errors and inaccuracies that go along with that. The recommendations in by functional area, I'm not going to belabor this. We, I tried to call this down for uh, ease of understanding this morning. Uh, first in HR, uh, we've got to improve some of the capabilities, some of those unit costs, because again, the users are saying uh, we're not spending enough time on some of the strategic areas of human resource, like leadership development, for example. Uh, like ensuring that teams have a, a way of working together uh, in a more comprehensive manner. So, again, human resource, uh, pretty efficient. We looked at it at the unit level. Some high uh, processing costs, but a need by the users to, if we found cost savings, to reinvest in areas. Obviously, that would be a separate decision to make along the way. IT, uh, again, as you heard the comment about 
uh, technology being deployed but not being fully utilized. One of the opportunities we have is uh, in a distributed environment where we have uh, individual work groups or skunk works that are managing servers at a local level. Uh, that brings in high cost. It brings in risk of uh, data integrity. So that first point is to simplify the maintenance, the ongoing support of those in, in that operating environment. Uh, we talked about self-service capabilities as a way of decreasing some of that demand that comes into those uh, clerical operations. And obviously, as we make the investment, the business case for technologies, we've got we to ensure that there's broad deployment. Uh, we can't have an, uh, a business case that assumes uh, broad deployment and then along the way uh, kind of an opt-out just because. So we'll have to be sure that we uh, tend that along the way. Procurement uh, is generally a story that has been underway for a number of years. In fact, we're having a workshop next week uh, where we have invited uh, our other four-year public institutions in the state to come in and look at what we're doing in a procurement because we have made an investment in some of our supply chain. We're now going to see if there's a way of leveraging that for the benefit of some of the community colleges and four-year publics that may not be getting the benefit of, of scale economics today. That would help the university by increasing our scale, but obviously would allow others to share in that regard. So it's building on that and continuing to emphasize the, the shared service governance um, as opposed to being in control. We want to ensure particularly as we bring others in the environment. We just brought University of Missouri uh, Healthcare, the hospital under that environment last year, so emphasizing that shared governance being an important part of that. Finance, uh, we clearly have to understand the opportunity to streamline some of the financial support processes. And I think one of our key findings here is uh, before we get all wrapped up in perhaps creating a center, uh, there may be uh, thousands of transactions that we can eliminate or reduce by clarifying some of our procedures, process, and policies that may have inadvertently caused us to have to uh, uh, go through a transaction to start with. There was many examples floating around, including one where we're, uh, we may have a transfer of accounts between organizations, and that transfer of accounts may be for a $25 item. Well, it may cost us $1,000 to go through and to close the books accurately to process that transaction. So in some cases it was, well, do we have our threshold set too low in order to accomplish that? Let me quickly hit four themes that came out of this. Uh, obviously, it ties back into some of the recommendations. Procurement to continue adoption, as I mentioned, of those shared service center principles, shared governance, if you will. Second, to be sure that we go ahead and deal with, uh, early on, the adoption of policy procedures that emphasize this end user service and reduce required transactions. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Third, improve technology implementation. Uh, to promote, promote that end user experience, and fourth, uh, to evaluate the opportunity, and this is kind of by design, kind of the fourth stage, is there opportunity to continue, like has occurred already on most of our campuses, first looking within a department or a dean or a provost or a chancellor for that synergy opportunity, and there's cases, uh, a few faculty members in this room have brought up examples, even their own department, where uh, a clerk may be serving one or two uh, as opposed to a chair or a dean taking on that responsibility as first order of action. And really it leaves the last step um, to be taken very carefully. Will there ultimately be an opportunity to look more broadly across the system or across the campus for uh, deploying shared service? But I think our attempt for the last page is to now put this in the hands of the functional leaders to deal with these policies, procedures, see what transaction volume could be reduced, what efficiencies and service support could be identified as a first order of business. And uh, we have asked the functional leaders, uh, Nikki, Betsy, Gary, working with their steering committee colleagues to uh, take that next cut at that set of activities. Uh, we think there's some immediate opportunities and we're gonna go uh, pursue those, whether it's in uh, renegotiating uh, vendor contracts that were identified, we think there's some, quote, low hanging fruit and finally, uh, as we talked yesterday in regards to capital projects, to be sure that if we were to go that final step on cap center or shared service that we use a business case approach because in those cases you're having to spend some money to ultimately save some money. I think uh, probably a year ago I sized this total spend uh, north of $100 million. I think as we worked our way and you winnow your way through that, there's probably an achievable uh, with some work, $10 million to pull out of that, so a 10% savings. Uh, you could stretch that and probably get that to a much higher number based on, on a number of years of activity, but I think our opportunity is to go in and start to work toward that, uh, that $10 million savings across that breadth 
of activities that were identified up front, and that may take us, again, a number of years to achieve that. So that is uh, our status of shared services. We'll continue to uh, come back and talk about that, and, and I'll uh, cover in the, with the Board of Curators that will continue to be on my objectives list anyway to uh, continue to move in this regard. In terms of some uh, upcoming opportunities, we have the Missouri 100 meeting, which will be our third meeting uh, in early October, October 8th and 9th. I think we have a great program for those uh, that are part of the Missouri 100 group. Obviously, the curators are all invited to that. Uh, it'll be a, uh, per feedback from that group, a very deep uh, uh, dive and inspection about some of our research. So we've got a great afternoon, that Friday afternoon, where we're going to have a number of our research uh, faculty will be demonstrating what they do uh, and how that impacts Missouri from a uh, resource standpoint. As you know, one of the key issues that I think we've all got to be aware of is the research that we do as a land-grant institution as the University of Missouri is what makes us distinctive and unique. And the more we can get that word out as we differentiate what we do versus Central Missouri or Missouri Southern and so forth, I think that helps our certainly our General Assembly understand that perspective. Obviously, with November elections, we're going to have our uh, hands full as we uh, bring on board and help educate uh, the General Assembly. And Steve, how many uh, new members will be coming on? 75. 75 new members. There will not be a uh, freshman orientation tour this year because of cost concerns by, by uh, Jefferson City, by General Assembly. So we're going to have to do a lot of outreach to get, uh, to get that group, uh, quote, up to speed on our issues. In that regard, I gave, I've given you a uh, one-page uh, handout as part of uh, part of the package. We've been asked by a lot of our constituent groups, including Chambers of Commerce and RCG and Candace in St. Louis and the City Council, uh, all of the state advocacy groups, our own um, uh, outreach groups, alumni, alumni alliance, to be sure that we can articulate pretty clearly out of the gate what our key priorities are. So I won't go through this at this point in time, but no surprises on there. Operating budget, uh, capital improvement requirements, uh, revenue enhancements. We've started to uh, be very active in that discussion. That's not without controversy, whether it's uh, uh, dealing with a t uh, alcohol tobacco tax, uh, our interest in ensuring that tax credit reform is uh, looking at tax credits and how they apply, and certainly economic development and issues like Mosira last year we think would be very important. We also want to be sure that we have a chance to talk to the General Assembly about actions that we've already taken, and that's a long discussion. But I think uh, if you look at what we did last year, we've got another slip sheet that uh, supports this. It wasn't just taking a 5.2 percent cut. Uh, our other curator programs, some of those were zeroed out. Uh, and again, the university obviously absorbs on an ongoing basis another 2 to 3 percent of uh, unit cost increases, whether it's utilities or other costs. So we've got another page that goes through in some more detail uh, what our costs are. And obviously, as the board approved our 2011 budget submission, uh, embedded in that was issues like UMSL equity adjustment, was like funding care, caring for Missourians, funding the STEM initiative that uh, Chancellor Carney talked about yesterday. So again, wanted to uh, highlight that for you as we uh, think about the opportunities. Go back. I want to. Um, kind of put a marker out there that for 2012, I think certainly uh, at the administration level, uh, we will need to take on a, a strategic planning uh, review. And certainly as the new board comes on, uh, I think uh, it will be important for the board to uh, be active next year and perhaps in a board retreat uh, at a strategic planning level. Uh, we certainly know what our challenges are, how we think ahead about what the university needs to do to anticipate those challenges, call it uh, a 2020 plan or Vision 2020. Uh, that, I think, can be the moniker for us to uh, take on a, uh, a uh, kind of an update or significant look at strategic planning for the university. We know funding can be the, uh, uh, obviously the impetus for that, but it can't just be about that topic. It's got to be about uh, our mission and how we can continue to serve the state. So I would submit to you that uh, uh, we will certainly trigger that uh, from within, but certainly I would, I would hope the board would want to engage with, with us on that. Finally, let me talk a little bit about tuition. There's been a lot of discussion both from the governor as well as from the Department of Higher Education about the tuition process this year, as was talked about yesterday. Uh, without question, uh, we will need to be coming to the board uh, for a proposition to increase tuition. Uh, I think the board uh, should expect that will require us to uh, 
ask for a waiver from the department. Uh, as you recall, the, the rules are with Senate Bill 389 that you have to apply for a waiver if you have a tuition increase beyond what inflation would be in the last couple of years. That's run the gamut from 1% to 2%. It could be as high as 3% this year. Uh, so we'll have to uh, obviously wait until we see what the ultimate governor's budget recommendation would be uh, for support of higher education. But uh, I think we know that uh, we will need to do work uh, with the board at the December meeting, kind of laying out how we're thinking about that, coming up to a decision by the board in January for what that recommendation would be. And that's to allow us to uh, uh, move in a timely manner with the department so that, you know, by the May time frame as we prepare for uh, calendar year 2012, the campuses can be fully ready to support that. Yesterday, the, the uh, topic came up about uh, uh, differential uh, pricing. Uh, again, the board uh, took that on, I think, uh, rightfully so. Uh, a couple of years ago, this will be our first opportunity to uh, exercise that so the campuses know that uh, uh, they have the opportunity to make that case uh, uniquely by each campus and certainly uh, over the next couple of months, way before that gets to you all in December or January, we'll be working that process internally. So I just wanted to give you uh, an update on that. Uh, like a lot of our discussions, we will uh, bring the board, uh, as we did yesterday, I think Nikki's presentation yesterday on student financial aid was, again, part of framing uh, this tension around access and affordability, what's happening with state support, uh, and now, obviously, our need as a result of not having raised tuition in the last couple of years and what we know is going to be a very tough budget year to uh, match up to that. So, again, hopefully these pieces are fitting together uh, in that regard. You know, there's no new news or new update on the state uh, budget situation. Uh, every bit of data that we continue to get and we talk, uh, you know, weekly, if not more frequently, with various contacts with the state is the state is still expecting that uh, – you know, four to five hundred million dollar shortfall uh, to the state budget. And as you know, from a from a budget perspective within the state, higher education represents a very significant part of the variable part of the budget, meaning judgments uh, get made about uh, how budgets will be allocated. So work that we'll have to do, obviously, uh, you know, to uh, defend uh, what we do. And I think we've got a good story in order to do that. So with that, let me ask the chancellors to come up and uh, be mindful of of our time this morning, and we'll start with, I think, an alphabetical order with Chancellor Carney. Did we have them loaded up alphabetically? Or how did you? You were going by first names alphabetically. Okay, here we go. We'll be flexible. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Chancellor. Good morning. As President Forsey said, we're obviously looking ahead here, so Jack and I are, can be flexible on the beginning. And as we look at our – we were going to focus this morning on enrollment issues, and as you look at freshman classes coming into the university, that's a, a great perspective on looking to the future. It's great to see so many students uh, here with us this morning as well. As we opened on August 23rd, we saw at – at the University of Missouri in Columbia, we saw the largest class in MU history of over 6,000 uh, entering freshmen. And it was also the most ethnically and geographically diverse class in the history of the university. Our total enrollment, a new record of over 32,000, and a new record for undergraduates of almost 25,000 students. So significant growth at all levels was something that we were greeted with. Uh, it was not unexpected. That's consistent with the enrollment management process and the targeted recruiting that we've been engaged in, trying to build a bit of resiliency into the university as well as we look to potential downturns in uh, the high school graduation rates in 2011 and 12. So we're sort of preparing for the future from a revenue standpoint even as we do this. Most impressive, I think, was the well-prepared students that are coming to the university, and for good reason. I'll take just a moment to comment on the students, uh, their preparation, how we're supporting them with faculty, with accommodations, and with facilities that enrich their learning experience at the university. We're very proud of the, in in the quality of the, of the students staying high as measured by the most relevant measures that we can find, the ACT score of 25.6, same as last year. Uh, remains at the highest level that it's been in the past nine years. We also had an increase in scholarship recipients coming to the university. And most importantly, 
we have placed tremendous emphasis on retaining the students and graduating them. And that retention rate is now at 69.2. I can tell you as chancellor, I'm not going to be happy until that's at 75%. And we're not there yet. And we're working and with Provost Foster and others on our campus. Uh, that's a stretch goal. It's not one that, let's say, I expect to reach in my tenure even necessarily, but I'm going to make darn sure that the pieces are in place to get there eventually. As you'll recall, it wasn't very long ago, we were looking at 56% retention rate. And we've made tremendous progress, but we've got a long way to go. And it's one of the most important aspects of low-cost recruiting and of ensuring that we're meeting the graduation uh, requirements for our citizens and workers of tomorrow. So we're pleased with what's happening, but we want to do better here. We're also trying to help students continue to afford the university as we emphasize uh, the issues of cost as uh, a national issue. Uh, we believe that the university is doing its part uh, to achieve this goal. We provided more financial aid uh, in history, even with our budget constraints that we have. We provided over $110 million in financial aid from our own budget this year. That includes endowed scholarships and grants, graduate tuition and fee waivers, and merit and need-based scholarships. This does not include any loan funds. We, in fact, provide an additional million dollars uh, in, in support to students through part-time hiring. We've expanded our hiring of students part-time on the campus, and that's resulted in 300 more students being able to work within the university environment. Athletics, for example, generates most of the scholarship funds for student athletes and continues to raise money to provide that kind of support. So we're working with all the options to ensure the afford affordability and the access of students to the university. Accommodating these record numbers of students is also one of the challenges that we've faced, and we've made progress in a number of areas here as well. Students that live in our extended campus locations have access to the same professional and student staff members living on site. They have access to meal plan options, free shuttle service, regular patrols by the MUPD, and the freshman interest groups. We expanded that by eight this fall to accommodate uh, additional student groups on the campus, the, the growth in freshman enrollment. And the renovations, thanks to the bonding that we discussed yesterday, the renovations of Tate and Switzler Hall on our campus will result in 12 new classroom spaces be provided as soon as those become uh, available in the fall of 2011. So we're positioned for additional classroom space, even as we're uh, looking to new alternatives there as we look to the future. And we have a new master planner uh, working with us. And Jackie Jones is here and is providing tremendous leadership in that regard to find new ways of integrating faculty accommodations and student accommodations in a learning environment in ways that we hope will gain new efficiencies uh, using technology and, and a careful space planning for the university. We have also uh, award-winning faculty in so many areas that continue to be the main reason we feel why uh, so many students want to continue coming to the University of Missouri. Charles Davis, for example, Associate Professor of Journalism, is one of the great examples of this. He just received one of two awards that's given globally by the National Press Club of Governors, and that's the uh, 2010 John Obushan Freedom of Press Award. One's given to a domestic uh, person and one to an international recipient, and he was the winner this past year. He's one of five, by the way, high-quality facilitators that are leaving the Mizzou Advantage, the central part of our strategic planning as we look to the future. And he's directing the media of the futures component of those Mizzou advantages. If you've watched the news the last few days, you've seen another major faculty award given to Fred von Saal, a biology professor at the university, uh, received a $100,000 Heinz Award, one of 10 awards given globally uh, for excellence in research and scholarship. And he received $100,000 uh, for the Heinz Award for his research on the damaging effect of human health from components of plastics. And this is something he's devoted his, his career to researching. Facilities are vitally important. And if you've been on the campus and noticed all the construction that's occurring, you've seen examples of this. Uh, the main commons of our new student center, the MU Student Center, uh, opened August the 18th with all kinds of new dining options, bookstore uh, space as part of this. 
and new seats for our record-breaking enrollment that will be very helpful in our student recruiting for the future. We will have this final portion of the uh, MU Student Center completed later this fall, six months ahead of planned schedule. So we're very pleased with that. This, as you will recall, was the expansion that was created by the April 2005 MU students passing a referendum to increase student fees to help support and expand what was uh, the current uh, Brady Commons uh, to facilitate this very beautiful and attractive new space for our students. We have a new that student center opening, by the way, it will be uh, October the 22nd. Uh, we want to invite you uh, to be there with Mort Walker, uh, a famous alumnus and cartoonist of Think Beetle Bailey, uh, will be with us. And this is during homecoming week, so we hope that many of you will be there to help us celebrate this wonderful event. Everything is black and gold in Columbia right now and around the university, and uh, we are trying to strengthen our brand by emphasizing that. It's evident across the campus. Uh, crews from campus facilities uh, in August replaced their traditional street signs with black and gold signs with a tiger emblem display. This was all funded by the Mizzou Alumni Association, let me say. And we officially announced on September the 17th uh, the changing of the name of Maryland Avenue to Tiger Avenue. That was passed by the City Council in Columbia. We're very appreciative to the City Council for joining with the university in this display of pride in the black and gold and in the Mizzou brand. So it captures the spirit of what we're all about. It's something that's vital for faculty, students, and staff, and the citizens of Columbia and the state of Missouri. Thanks so much for this chance to share these thoughts with you. And Jack, I'll turn to you with that. Any, I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Well, what time is that grand opening? Uh, the opening on uh, at homecoming week. Do you know the time of that? Anyone back there? Jackie, Ken? I, I don't have that. David. We can get it. We'll get it to everybody. Um, Brady, uh, how much room, if any, do you have for further expansion? We we have a master planner that's been working with us, and we're working on just that question of how much additional expansion we can have. I think in our general discussion, and this is very general, we have said that we believe we can move toward 35,000 at this point, but we, are, we must uh, work in a very innovative way with space planning and particularly on, uh, on classroom space at this point. And so that's our plans, and those are not uh, concrete. That's, that's right top of that. I'm looking at a group of my staff back here, probably a bit nervous, but uh, that, is, that is our general discussion at this point. But classroom space is becoming critical, and our new master planner is very creative. And one of these days, I hope you'll get a chance to listen to her talk about space. There's major pilot projects going on around the nation right now, one at Stanford University. We are now with uh, Jackie's staff are engaged in, in planning. We will be one of the pilot projects of America to try to find new innovative ways of integrating teaching space with office space and with other facility space at the university. Uh, new thinking that's as exciting as the new uh, advantages that IT brings right now. So we're excited about that. Yes? Three to four o'clock, October 22nd. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, before Jack gets going on his report, I'd like to ask all the curators, if you're asking a question, direct it to your microphone, not to the speaker, because the people are having trouble hearing you that are listening on the web. Okay? Good morning, everyone. This is our incoming freshman class. Eleven hundred and seventy of them. We expected about 300 transfer students. We got 388, 32 states represented, nine foreign countries. The average uh, ACT score of our incoming class, 27.7, which translates into the upper 8 to 10 percent in the nation. And five of these perfect freshmen uh, received perfect scores in their ACT or SAT tests. We're stuck percentage-wise on 24% female. Of course, as our enrollment has uh, 
gone up by 50 percent. The numbers of men and women have increased, but proportionally, uh, we'd love to get uh, the women up to 30 percent. Uh, we seem to be stuck on 24. Uh, about five years ago, uh, the interest in engineering and science on the part of uh, young ladies peaked, and unfortunately, it seems to be dropping a bit, so we need to turn that around. Uh, notice that 80% of our undergraduates come from Missouri, and 27% are still first-generation college students, 27%. And we're talking about uh, a typical residential college environment, an 18-year-old freshman. Uh, we have very few part-time students uh, in Rolla. Just again to uh, uh, make the point, in 2000 we had 4,626 students. Uh, we had a goal in uh, a year from now uh, to get up to about 6,550. And uh, today, counting distance education, we're up over 7,200 students. The green graph represents the females on campus. We've uh, just smashed through the 1600 mark. I'm concerned about uh, total minorities because of the decrease in financial aid, which we're facing as a state, a nation, companies, corporations are cutting back because of the tough times. So you see we're flat on uh, underrepresented minorities, and my concern is that those numbers may actually start to go down. Just last month, Popular Science came out with an edition of their magazine in which they ranked laboratories at universities. And I'm just going to give you a flavor for their, their top 15. Uh, Stanford was at 15, Florida, MIT at 12, Carnegie Mellon, Cornell, pretty nice uh, institutions, Texas Tech, Colorado State, and so on. And number one is Missouri S&T. And there's a handout in front of you. We, we're, we're trying to take maximum advantage of this publicity. Uh, that's a pretty impressive photograph. That's Paul Warsey, uh clowning it up there in the middle of that picture. And um, uh, that, that explosives engineering program, of course, we have the only master's degree program in explosives engineering in the country. We've had a very good research year. 09 was actually a very good year for us. And, uh, fiscal uh, 2010 just smashed through those records. So we're at all-time highs with respect to uh, proposals awarded in terms of total dollars, expenditures, and indirect recovery. Our capital campaign ended at the end of June. It was a seven-year campaign. The goal was $200 million. We raised almost $212 million. There are quite a few uh, capital projects going on in Rolla, most of them funded with gift money from our alumni. Uh, this is uh, the building that uh, is at the corner of 10th and Bishop. For those of you familiar with Rolla, the, the Gail Bowman buildings in the background. This is what it looks like today. And this is what it will look like in December. And we're going to turn this uh, renovated $2.5 million uh, project over to our student design teams so that they can work their magic in nice facilities. Uh, Fred and June Kummer uh, contributed uh, $1.25 million of the $2.5 million price tag. And this will be called the uh, Kummer Student Design Center. Now, in the old building, uh, in this, what will be the design center, the athletes were practicing in uh, terrible conditions in January and February when the weather was lousy. So we didn't want to throw the athletes out in the snow. So again, our alumni came through, Keith Bailey and others, and we've got an indoor practice facility which is almost ready to be dedicated. It's going to be dedicated on the 2nd of October, which is our homecoming weekend. 11 a.m. in the morning, and you're all welcome to attend that dedication, have a hot dog, and then go to the football game. 
and another capital project uh, on the uh, what used to be the driving range of the golf course right next to the football stadium. That 56-acre complex over time will be our research park. We call it Innovation Park. The first building is uh, coming along nicely. Uh, it will be finished in December as well. And we've got uh, GE Aviation moving in, A123, Missouri Enterprise, and others. We expect it to be uh, fully occupied soon. So this is uh, big news on the uh, uh, research front in Rolla. Of course, companies are moving into Rolla to be next to our faculty, to, uh, to get close to our best students. And along those lines, there's another handout uh, in front of you. We had our career fair uh, three days ago. Uh, with 185 companies uh, on campus hiring our students, and that's up from last year, so that's a good economic sign. And even in these tough times, uh, Missouri S&T students are getting hired, and the average starting salary of our bachelor's degree graduates uh, is at about 58000 which is the third highest average starting salary of any public university in the United States. Of course, we're, we're all talking about the financial issues we're dealing with. Uh, we really need to uh, give our faculty and staff some raises, if at all possible. Uh, there's no question in my mind that we need to raise tuition. Uh, our, our students have uh, loans of 23, 24K when they graduate, but the salaries they'll be commanding, uh, uh, it really isn't that big a deal to, uh, to pay those loans off. So I still think that the uh, University of Missouri system in general, and Roller in particular, is an incredible bargain, and we need to raise tuition. I just mentioned the capital projects. And uh, we have two commencements, the December commencement on the 18th, and President Forsey has agreed to be our commencement speaker. Thank you very much. Jack, what will the uh, bulk of that uh, $212 million uh, fundraiser go for? Will that go for student aid mostly? Or the, student aid, the student aid, the student aid, is professorships. We're going to put some of it in our endowment. Uh, we'll have no trouble spending spending that money. <laughs> Jack, um, as we consider tuition increases, as President Forsey talked about, as we consider tuition increases, as President Forsey talked about earlier today, and differentiating those among the campuses. Um, are you and are the other chancellors doing some sort of analysis, I assume you are, at um, the effect of increasing tuition on uh, the demand uh, and the enrollment? Yes, yes, clearly we are. Uh, and it's, tuition needs to be increased, but we've, we're getting increasing pressure on uh, reductions in financial aid, so it's a really tough tough problem. But the most important thing is to protect the quality of the academic programs. And we can't do that without uh, the finances to do so. So it's going to be tough. Uh, but uh, the, the, the education we're providing is well worth the money. That's our, that's our position. And Chancellor Downey, I think you're kind of asking the elasticity question. You know, it, it, it's we're now, I think, and I made this comment, I think, at the last meeting, it seems like we're a bit off trend because the recession is causing probably more students to stay in state, uh, more than might have considered going to private institutions to go to public institutions. So it's kind of offset some of what the demographics would have probably caused the high school graduation to be flattening in the state. We're getting some counter issues here. So it'll, it'll make that study a bit more complicated as a result of that, but I think the chancellors and their their teams are on all over that and know that know that uh, you know needle is going to have to be threaded as, as Jack said for that perspective. But that's that trending is uh, we're a little bit off track because of what's happened with uh, off trend because of what's happened with the recession. The other the other phenomenon that's occurring, and I attribute this in part to our name change three years ago. The, uh, the out-of-state applications and international applications for the undergraduate uh, have increased substantially. And of course, our out-of-state uh, tuition is two and a half times our in-state tuition. Well, good morning.
morning. Uh, thanks to a great team at uh, UMKC, we had a uh, we had a very good year last year. Um, I can report that um, our students uh, say that they uh, we managed to give them a great experience. We, in fact, we conferred over 2,900 degree, uh, degrees, and um, we we did a little survey. And among those responding to the survey, 70% of them reported that they had a job. And uh, of those who had a job, 75% said they were staying in the Kansas City area. Uh, from, an, from a financial standpoint, we also had a good year in that we were able to uh, increase our fund balance by about 36%, and probably the single largest contributor to that was our growth in enrollment. Uh, what this, uh, I guess, if we, go to, if we go to that first chart, this first chart shows the, you that uh, last year enrollment was up about 4.3%. And, um, of course, students pay by the credit hour. And our credit hours were up about 5.4%. This year, uh, enrollment's up 3.2%, but student credit hours are up almost 6%. So all of that's uh, headed in the right direction. And one of the things I wanted to point out here, you've heard this before, but I wanted you to pay particular attention to the growth in undergraduate versus graduate and professional. Uh, I think you've, you've heard before that we are somewhat imbalanced at UMKC, that our, if you go back to uh, 2007 there, our undergraduate population was 58% of total enrollment, uh, and graduate, uh, of course, was a balance. Uh, at most universities, uh, especially uh, a university like MU, for example, there's probably an 80-20 balance. Now, we will probably never get there, but there are some significant financial implications associated with that balance because of the the, the, uh, the student-teacher ratio for the graduate and professionals, uh, much more expensive there. So our focus has been on increasing, no, go back to that chart, our focus has been on increasing undergraduate enrollment, and as you can see from this chart, we are experiencing some success there. So if you go to the next chart, uh, the other thing we wanted to do was make sure we understood the, uh, the makeup of that, uh, of that growth. Uh, because it is such an important part of, of what we look at. So retention, as has been mentioned before, is a very important uh, uh, focus for us. And as you can see, uh, retention uh, in, in terms of continuing students is increasing. And we believe the driver there is uh, the type of experience we've been able to give to our students. The fact that we have uh, changed the environment on campus is causing them to want to stay with us longer. Uh, certainly, the, the transfer students are also increasing, and uh, we believe the driver there is our work with the Metropolitan Community Colleges in, in developing dual admissions. And um, very important, first-time uh, college students uh, that is really our focus, and this year we have welcomed the largest uh, freshman class in our history, including the largest number of uh, first-time college goers that we've ever experienced. Enrollment is also at a record level this year with almost 14,000 students without counting our dual credit uh, high school students. Uh, once we count those, we're well over 15,000 students. So. Important also is, is understanding how this is working from, uh, from an ethnicity standpoint. A lot of the reports that I hear uh, and read about uh, nationally suggest that uh, college going among diverse students is not keeping pace with their white counterparts. So we want to pay particular attention to that as we look at the makeup of our first time college students and what this suggests is that we're holding our own. If I can explain this to you a little bit, the first column looks at, uh, at 2009 when we had first-time college students of about 1,000, and the percentages there indicate what percentage of that 1,000 were represented by African-American, Hispanic, and so forth. And you'll see that uh, African-Americans were about 17% of that 1,000. This year, 2010, while we welcomed over 1,100 students, we, we tended to maintain that same uh, percentage. So that suggests that 
while the trends nationally might be headed in the wrong direction, we seem to be holding our own. And as we look at the representation of those groups in our overall population, we, we seem, to be, seem to be holding our own there as well. So that was good news. We also have focused, as I said before, on transfer students. They are a, a large part of our population. Uh, this chart, looking at it the same way, suggests that we're also making progress among African American Latino uh, population as well. So these, all of these numbers suggest that we're doing a lot of the right things. Uh, the next chart, however, identifies a, um, a set of additional items we think you should know about uh, enrollment this year. One is that <clears throat> while the retention data is not in yet, uh, we believe that our, our progress on continuing students, the increase in the number of students continuing with us uh, will bode well for uh, that number once we finish calculating it. And uh, also, as has been reported in, in other, uh, by the other chancellors, our ACT scores uh, remain at the, at the same level as last year. Our average ACT score is 24.1, not quite as high as the others, uh, but it was uh, 24.1 this year as well. Um, we have, you uh, uh, allowed us to extend the metro rate to an additional seven counties. Uh, while um, we, it's a little early to tell, uh, the, the news thus far is promising. Uh, we, um, there was two aspects to that really. Allowing us to do that also allowed us to make an adjustment in, in another issue that was affecting our students. Um, there was an agreement that out-of-state students could get uh, in-state if they didn't take more than a certain number of hours if they attended part-time. By putting, allowing this metro rate to be extended, we eliminated that pressure, which allowed us to end, uh, our students to take more credit hours. So there's, uh, that, that is also working in our favor. And overall, as I mentioned before, while the head, head count uh, is up 3.2%, Importantly, the um, uh, student credit hours are up uh, about 6% almost. Now, finally, challenges. Well, you've heard this before, but um, success uh, creates additional issues. Our success with retention and enrollment improvements uh, have certainly increased the uh, pressure on classrooms and, and parking. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I bump into people uh, I was at an event um, last week on campus, and we had uh, several events going at once, uh, but students and, and uh, visitors to the campus are having great difficulty with, with parking. But classrooms are probably our number one concern, and that's why you saw those high on our list for uh, capital improvements if we can get this, uh, this bonding uh, done. Uh, compensation for faculty, you've heard that as well. We are asking our faculty and staff to do more with less, and um, we have to demonstrate to them that we are pulling for them, and we are, and the President's suggestion that we put a 2% increase into our uh, planning for next year is, is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, One-time funding for caring for Missourians, I think you know, we have got to do something, work together to uh, increase the amount of collaboration that we have to, to get long-term funding for that initiative. I think that, was, uh, that also came up this morning in your discussions. I'm happy it did because uh, one of the uh, premier programs within that is our work with uh, uh, MSU on a uh, PharmD program. So we'd, uh, we need to get that funding in place. Uh, finding the right balance uh, between tuition increases and access to meet our uh, next year's uh, challenges. Uh, I think everyone has mentioned that. Uh, certainly access is an issue for us, and, uh, but tuition increases are certainly in the wind. And, uh, but finding the right balance is what we're looking at right now. Uh, we don't believe that we have as much elasticity on that, on that front as, uh, as others may have. So. Uh, we have the, the fact that you have decoupled uh, tuition for the campuses is very important for us. We, we want to make sure we do the right thing on that front. Uh, <clears throat> we also have this final point that I made here is that the sluggish economy in, impacts us. I mean, it's, it's a positive when it comes to enrollment, but it does impact us on the fundraising side. We have this unusual mix of donors to UMKC. 
the, the foundations and corporations uh, contribute, uh, make up over 60% of the donors to, to UMKC. And uh, that number in most universities is in the teens, less, certainly less than 20%. So those units, are, those organizations, foundations and corporations have been affected by the economy and it's making our uh, efforts with them a little more challenging, but, uh, but in spite of that, we still had probably one of our fourth best years in our history last year. But that is increasing our challenge for this coming year, and, and their support is going to be very important as we face uh, the years ahead. So with that, um, if there are no questions, Tom, yes. Maybe on the elasticity of Coast Security down and brought that up, the difference in UMKC and UMSL perhaps versus Rolla and Columbia is around the community college proximity. Right. Where there that um, the general education courses may be 30% less costly. So the competition uh, on that first year students, first second year students is more acute and obviously our two urban campuses. But yet that's why we uh, Talked about the differential or differentiated or disaggregated uh, pricing. Just a couple quick things. Congratulations on the enrollment growth. I think everybody has heard me say before how important undergraduate enrollment growth at Kansas City is for increasing our institutional revenues. That's the one big factor we have over there to really drive revenues to address needs. The uh, expansion that the board allowed for the metro rate into the 11 counties is having an impact and we'll probably see that impact uh, more significantly going forward. Glad to see that's working, and once we get our marketing efforts kicked in, it ought to really start showing some impact. I, as everybody knows, I'm just delighted that we're going to look at disaggregated tuition concepts, bring forward to uh, the system to take a look at it. I, I would think that it, it, you know, at least at UMKC, we might look even to the degree level because we have certain programs like the conservatory there that are just uh, prime oversubscribed and not priced to market. And uh, I, hope, I hope that there'll be the discretion to at least look at some of those things. We and certainly are right now. The work is underway. Uh, the research is going on that will inform the process in the next couple of months. Yeah. Uh, good job. Well, I, I, might, I might want to get in on a little bit of that new facility uh, announcement stuff. Um, we have uh, just finished our robot for the library, uh, the high density storage and retrieval system, our uh, christening. I've, I've even been in there to load the robot, so as you know what a thrill that is for an engineer. But um, our, our opening, I think we dedicate that facility at the end of this month. I will get you the, uh, the dates and times. Uh, but we just also opened the new student union, and um, it is... Um, I, 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 I can't wait for you to get there and get a chance to, uh, to have a meeting there. The students, uh, you know, it was all done with student fees, so with some persuasion they did agree to let you meet there. So, uh, so we'll, be, we'll be pleased to, uh, to get you in there as well. It is really changing the atmosphere on the campus and making it a, a destination. So we'll let you know about that uh, dedication as well. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about University of Missouri, St. Louis. And uh, like my colleagues at the other three campuses, I'm going to start with enrollment. Uh, we've reached this year an all-time high in enrollment for University of Missouri, St. Louis, 16,550 students, nearly 13,000 that are degree-seeking, and then we also have 3,500 students that are uh, doing, uh, if you will, dual admission. Uh, they're not admission, but dual credit. Uh, taking our courses in the high schools. Our ACT is up. I think this is the highest we've ever reached is 23.6. Not quite as high as the other campuses, but uh, moving up. But it jumped from 22.8. And uh, like with Leo, uh, our increases in student credit hours is higher than the increases in the actual headcount, meaning that the students are taking more courses. If we look at enrollment by level, uh, we're still a growing research university. I mean, we, you know, we have to remember that we were founded from scratch in 1963. We have 15 doctoral programs. So we're trying to increase our graduate enrollment in, in contrast to the University of Missouri, Kansas City. If you also look at these other categories, you'll see that we look very lopsided. Uh, we have 
the, you know, the number of seniors and juniors far outweighs the number of sophomores and freshmen. That's because we are very heavy on transfers. Three quarters of our first time students at the undergraduate level are transfers, largely from the uh, community college system. We are making a conscious effort to increase the number of first time freshmen. That's happening. We now have 1,500 beds on campus. But I think we will continue to be a heavy transfer institution. Let me give you an example of, well, you know, a happy slide. Uh, let, let's go, yeah, go to the next one, a happy slide. Um, you know, we, we're Division II athletics. I, I like to remind you almost every time about this. this. is the Great Lakes Valley Conference for 16 teams. A lot of excitement in Division II, and Rall is part of MSNT is part of this conference. And uh, this past weekend, the women's golf team won the Screaming Eagle Tournament uh, with a single high. That's four golfers of 299. Our women's volleyball team is now, for the first time in nearly 20 years, is ranked 25th of the nation, actually 23rd right now. And uh, they're, they're just going gangbusters. And I do mention athletics because uh, I think, as in the other campuses, the graduation rates for our athletes far exceeds the rest of the student body. So there is something about that experience that uh, makes them perform better in the classroom. Let me tell you about a project. You know, we have all sorts of activities that happen with Express Scripts, but I'll just give you one example. Uh, we had our commencement ceremony for the summer in August, and we had a cohort of students, 15 of them, that are all Express Scripts employees, that we offered them an MBA program in their buildings. And we actually had uh, executives and others from Express Scripts teaching the courses along with us. And we've, we talked to the employees at Express Scripts, and this experience for them was particularly valuable because they got to know employees from other sectors within Express Scripts, and they all worked as a cohort. And this, again, it's an example of something that uh, you can do when you have a, a major corporation located on a university campus. Let me tell you a bit about rankings. Uh, we're, we're still a university, you know, increasing, and, uh, you know, if you look at us at the University of Missouri St. Louis, we provide the workforce, we participate in economic development, uh, we're opportunities for students. At the same time, we have rankings, and uh, I know we have U.S. News and World Report. Let me give you another example, Academic Analytics. This is an organization outside Philadelphia that's getting a lot of uh, mileage and wings right now. Uh, they, what they do is they rank faculty productivity. And it's in terms of publications, uh, editorial ships, um, uh, grant grants, and things of this sort. And uh, with these ranks, and hundreds of universities participate in this. And the rankings that just came out, our counselor education program in the Department of Education is ranked fourth in the nation for faculty productivity. Uh, information systems is in the College of Business Administration, ranked sixth in the nation. Uh, Criminology, criminal justice, on this report, ranked 15th. In U.S. News and World Report, they're ranked 4th. Uh, evolutionary biology, that's basically ecology, a, a program within our Department of Biology, ranked 16th in the nation, teaching and learning 19th. And actually, we've got a number of other political sciences in the top 30. So if you look at uh, how we are actually doing as a research university, which faculty productivity is one example, uh, we're really doing quite well. Let me give you some examples of faculty research. I've mentioned to you before Jim Bashkin, but I'm mentioning him again because he just got another grant, a $3 million grant from the National Institutes of Health. He's developing an antiviral drug that's going to uh, fight cervical cancer. Uh, he's brought in almost $10 million now in the last several years. Uh, let me also mention an award in our Department of Biology. Zalima Tang Martinez won uh, what's called the Quest Award, and this is from the Animal Behavioral Society, uh, a nationally recognized award. We have done very well in fundraising, and in spite of the economy, we're just bringing in more and more gifts, uh, both private gifts and uh, both gifts from corporations. We had a seven-year campaign. Uh, and we were going that which was starting in 2005. It was targeted at 100 million, the first the university ever had. We hit the goal this summer, and so we just had a founders' dinner celebration. The uh, president was there for that, and we set the goal now to 150. And so by 2012, hopefully, we can raise at least to 150, 150 million dollars. Let me just give you some examples of some of the. Uh, you know, gifts that are coming in. Uh, Boeing recently just gave us a million dollar gift, and this is for our new building for business administration. We're raising dollars for that. Uh, Edward Jones just gave us a million dollars for that building, on top of an earlier gift of a million dollars. Um, if you, um, going to the next slide, 
in, uh, what was I was saying, it was two days ago, the Post-Dispatch had a nice article uh, for our fundraising right on the front page of the Post-Dispatch. It's nice to have happy news uh, once in a while with the Post-Dispatch for higher education. But there's a picture there, if you go back, there's a picture there of David Nicholas who wrote the article, and I had a faculty member email me saying it was nice to see your picture. Uh, in the paper, so I'll take the credit for having my picture in the newspaper. Uh, what this particular uh, article was about is that um, I had a meeting with uh, David Farr and uh, George Paz recently in David Farr's office just brainstorming about what Emerson might be able to do for the university, and we came up with something called the Opportunity Scholars Program. And this is looking at first-generation underrepresented students, giving them the opportunities, very qualified students, to go to the University of Missouri, St. Louis with a full ride, but not just a full ride, but actually get special nurturing from industry. Uh, have people from industry come and work with students, mentoring, internships. And uh, Emerson's gonna put up a 1.65 million to jumpstart this. They're gonna give us another million. Uh, if we can not raise an additional million, they're gonna help us raise that. Uh, David and Thelma Stewart from Worldwide Technologies have contributed to this. Energizer from the Energizer Bunny, they're uh, contributing to this as well. Uh, we're very excited about this program. And the idea is to try to keep our very brightest students here uh, in the state. A lot of these students can get full rides anywhere, Harvard, Yale, uh, East Coast, what have you. We want to keep them right here uh, in, in St. Louis, in Missouri, and uh, that's part of this effort. So thank you for your attention. I heard a um, couple years ago um, at a um, faculty award, teacher award event that for teachers and faculty, students are the rewards. And I think for the curators, I hope you feel rewarded by those uh, four presentations. Uh, uh, last time I checked, your paychecks uh, you know, had a lot of zeros in it, so I hope you feel the reward for your efforts are uh, represented by uh, you know the support uh, that we need to provide to our faculty to provide the research and the teaching. Uh, the students uh, want to come to our universities now. So again, I, I thank the curators for what you do. I hope you feel rewarded by, by these reports and my chancellors this morning. Now we're going to have uh, the health care annual report, Dr. Williamson. Much, and thanks for the chance to come here to the Discovery Center. In the next 15 or 20 minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about the size and scope of our health sciences at MU, uh, what's going on at our three schools and the hospital and clinics, a little bit about uh, quality measures. Um, Curator Frazier and others have asked me to be sure to uh, keep you informed about the quality measures that, that uh, we keep track of, a little bit about our future plans, and then um, Kevin Nikas will come up and run through the numbers for you. First, just to give you a, a, a sense about the size and scope, um, remember the university hospital and clinics and the three schools are part of what we call now the MU um, health system. The hospital and clinics um, uh, sponsors about uh, 550,000 outpatient visits a year, about uh, 22 or 23,000 uh, hospitalizations. Among the three schools, we have about 3,500 students, um, about 600 degrees conferred a year and about 450 medical residents, those are the people that are after medical school and before practice. Those um, four areas together comprise about 7,500 faculty and staff with about $850 million in annual expenditures. And um, using the methodology of the Association of Academic Health Centers, we uh, believe that brings about 200, has about a two, $2 billion, $2 billion estimated uh, impact to Missouri, especially mid-Missouri. So a pretty big operation. The uh, School of Health Professions, you've heard um, um, from several of the chancellors about the growth in students in the School of Health Professions, I think actually is the uh, fastest growing group at the University of Missouri in Columbia. They have a record enrollment. Their, um, their enrollment is up about 128% since 2002. And Dean Oliver and his staff are doing a great job of trying to meet the healthcare needs of the future. The School of Health Professions has used Caring for Missourians money uh, to make class size additions in physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech and language pathology. And some of those they believe they'll be able to make permanently. As you know, the uh, Caring for Missourians money is um, uh, targeted to be one time. 
And um, finally, a, 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 an issue that I'd like to highlight, Dr. Oliver and his uh, staff have created what they call the Missouri Health Professions Consortium. This is a consortium with six community colleges around the state uh, in order to increase the output of uh, especially physical and occupational therapy professionals. And I highlight that because um, President Forsey and the governor have been um, pointing us in particular at trying to create um, consortia and collaborations which allow us to both be more efficient and also to help um, promote a, a, a more robust workforce in a faster manner. And Dr. Oliver has done that well. Dr. Uh, Judy Miller is the dean of the uh, Sinclair School of Nursing. They've uh, focused heavily on research and like to point out that they calculate they're the uh, number one in the nation for scholarly productivity, sort of grants and publications per faculty member among the AAU publics. Um, they've also increased their enrollment in all in their graduate programs, their accelerated program, and the RN to BSN program, about 100 students total um, this year over last. Uh, they also launched the new Doctor of Nursing Practice program with 56 students. For those of you who don't know, um, the Doctor of Nursing Practice in the future will be the, um, the, the program of choice for, for people that we traditionally now call advanced practice nurses. So Dr. Miller is also trying to ring the bell uh, and increase the workforce that we think the health reform is um, going to require. Dr. Churchill and the School of Medicine have also been very busy. I wanted to point out um, three large grant awards that we've celebrated in the last uh, three or four months. Eight and a half million dollar NIH award for cardiovascular disease research, a six point eight million dollar health and human services award for electronic medical record stimulation, a seven and a half million dollar NIH award for botanical interaction research. All these um, are, um, ha I want to point out that one of the great things about working at Mizzou is that there's really a lot of collaboration between the medical school and other researchers on campus. And none of those really would have been um, uh, possible with that, without that sort of collaboration. In addition, we have a, a $1.4 million award to help open a center for translational neuroscience. These aren't the only uh, research awards, by the way. I don't want you to think that. But um, these were three uh, big hits, and these are the kind of big grants that we're trying to go after that really uh, allow us to transform our, um, our research agenda. We were one of six sites selected by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. That was led until a few months ago by Don Berwick, who is now the head of uh, Medicare, the CMS, so it's nice to have uh, connections. Um, uh, joining us in those six select sites are Johns Hopkins and um, uh, a few other um, no-name universities. So this is largely due to the work of uh, Linda Hedrick, our senior associate dean, who has really put our medical school uh, on the map um, in a number of areas, and this is one. Speaking of on the map, uh, you know that one of our missions is to try to redress the shortage of uh, physicians in rural areas in the state, and to that end, we expanded our rural program to Lebanon, West Plains, and Maryville over the last year. Spoke with one of the physicians who um, practices and now is one of our teachers in Lebanon. He was just as excited as he could be, has his first two students, and says, send more. Um, finally, uh, the partnership that you've heard alluded to with the Springfield Health Systems, I spent yesterday afternoon and evening with the leaders from this community and certainly from um, St. John's and Cox, the big health systems here. And I would have to characterize those um, negotiations as spectacularly successful. In fact, they're going a lot faster than we anticipated. And um, I think this is the, the single best chance to increase the size of our medical school that we'll have in the next decade. And it's something that you'll be hearing more about. Um, a lot of naughty details, and then there's the money. But um, this will be an, an important possibility. I don't think we're going to be able to increase the size of the School of Medicine without a partnership like this. Um, leadership, I want to uh, give kudos to Dr. Uh, Churchill, who's pushed really hard on the issues of diversity and cultural competency in the School of Medicine, really been a leader on campus and um, is making uh, good headway. Also has been a leader in bringing the Baldrige criteria as a management model, and the school will be competing for the Missouri Quality Award. Not, I think it's the only medical school in the country that will certainly that's looking for the Missouri Quality Award, but has the Baldrige Award in its sights. And I, uh, really congratulate Bob for, for that leadership. Finally, some late breaking news that's not on the slide. Um, many of you who um, follow MU and certainly those of you who have been curators for a while 
um, re know that um, that the um, that the health care for MU athletes has been a contentious issue over the last five, actually over the last 40 years, but um, in my memory for sure over the last five years. And this week, um, university officials, uh, Dr. Pat Smith and the um, Columbia Orthopedic Group have signed a letter of agreement which will allow us to look at the future in a positive way instead of um, uh, ruminating on the past. And I'm really happy about that. Congratulations, and I should say thank you to President Forsey and Chancellor Deaton for their um, leadership. Thanks to Mike Alden for what he's done. Thank you to Steve Owens and his staff for helping us uh, craft a, um, an agreement that's complex uh, but, but very workable. And especially thanks to um, Dr. Stannard and Dr. Pat Smith for focusing on the future and not the past with me. And um, I think this is a really wonderful uh, good news story for us to be able to provide better health care for Mizzou athletes and also to ramp up our ability to do research and education in orthopedics, specifically in sports medicine. Dr. Smith will remain with the Columbia Orthopedic Group, but will also be an MU faculty member and help Dr. Stannard create and direct a fellowship in sports medicine. Dr. Stannard will in turn be the associate um, head team physician for MU's uh, sports teams, and they'll be having um, something like a press conference uh, in a few hours in Columbia. So I'm really happy to say that. I uh, wouldn't want to leave out Mr. Ross and his team who are running around with uh, hammers and saws and nails. Uh, you think, thanks to the um, approval that you've given, given uh, for us in the past, the transformation on the, the health sciences part of our campus is uh, stunning. Um, I'm kind of a people and program guy, and I've always sort of um, uh, not wanted to put too much emphasis on facilities, but I just can't tell you how many people in Columbia at the university come up and say, wow, you guys... Uh, I, I can see your rocket trail, but that's about all I can see. And that's really wonderful. Um, so I'll just tell you uh, uh, briefly about our move to Children's Hospital, about the Orthopedic Institute, about the um, new patient care tower, and also about the Missouri Psychiatric Center. And I want to spend a little bit of time about that because uh, we and you have stuck your necks out a little bit to take risk on this one, and it's a good success story. So September 9th, um, we moved. That's TJ, the uh, mascot for the Children's Hospital. Um, we, um, I think we had 20 different teams working for a year on being sure that we could move uh, every one of those children's from, children from the old hospital to the new without any hitches, and it went off that way. And, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, in the middle of it, we had a helicopter uh, transport to the new hospital, and that, and that went really well. So um, it's wonderful. Uh, we, I think the, on the opening we had um, a line of people at noon uh, waiting to get in, although uh, the, the uh, open house didn't start till 2. Lots of buzz in our community about this. The Women's and Children's Hospital will be the only Women's and Children's Hospital, is the only Women's and Children's Hospital in Missouri, has 157 beds, and um, we'll be probably looking to expand portions of it, including the NICU in the next several years. So we're very happy about that. The facilities are wonderful. The morale of our pediatricians and the patients is outstanding. That's a w wonderful story. Um, the Missouri Psychiatric Center did not open September 9th. Uh, it actually, uh, we assumed it's care, it, we assumed it uh, July 1st. We've had it now for a little over a year. Dr. Loriello, the, um, the uh, chair of psychiatry and the head of that hospital on the clinical side, recruited 12 new faculty members. I'm really proud to say that our admissions are up about 30%. So about five to 600 people got care under our management that didn't get care under the old management. Um, and I can tell you that we're also doing well financially, and Kevin may have some comments about that when he comes up. Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's changed from a uh, dowdy facility that you wouldn't want to walk through, much less be in, to one that's going to be uh, very nice, not fancy, but very nice, and I'm um, really uh, proud of that, and, and thank you for helping us uh, step up to a real need in our part of the state. Um, we opened the Missouri Orthopedic Institute on June 1st, and um, it is exceeding volume and patient satisfaction expectations. Lots of buzz in our community about that. The orthopedists are already making noise about the need to expand, and we're telling them work later and work on weekends. But uh, so this has been a great story, and and uh, and they're um, really the the orthopedists are happy. Great, um, great opportunity to recruit a wonderful set of uh, staff to work there, and um, we're as proud as we can be. 
the uh, foundation work for the new tower. And just to be uh, clear, the first two stories of this will be the Ellis Fischel Cancer Center, um, just for those of you who wonder where that's going to be. Um, uh, work began on that one uh, a few months ago. Uh, we hope to move into it in 2013. It will really allow us to shift from um, um, uh, uh, an institution which predominantly has um, two bedrooms, that is, rooms with two patients in them, which is the, has not been the standard of care for at least 10 years. It's one of the origins of our problem with patient satisfaction, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and this will allow us to change that markedly. I would tell you that right now this uh, beautiful eight-story building is a two-story hole in the ground, and um, if it doesn't stop raining, Mr. Ross and I are planning to dump some largemouth bass in there and make make some money by uh, letting people go fishing. It's uh, it's right now a huge muddy hole, but it, but we see we see that as progress. Uh, I, I promised Curator Frazier and others that I would give you updates about the quality of our health care. One, you know that Ellis Fischel received uh, a commendation from the American College of Surgeons. Um, about 25% of institutions in the country have received that. The Joint Commission certified us as a stroke center in August, a big deal for us and um, a, a mark of um, quality and experience. And finally, um, the Tiger Institute and uh, IT Works, which is our now um, Cerner-sponsored internal um, IT process has really uh, had its afterburners going, and we will be these these two projects. I, don't, I won't get into the detail about what they are, uh, but partly they're related to the fact that some people think that physicians' handwriting is illegible. I'm not sure why people would think that, but but that's part of it. These two things will allow us to be able to track um, uh, medications from the pharmacist's hand to the patient's mouth and already has prevented, we have documentation in a number of um, medic prevented medication errors, which is a real bugaboo in hospitals. And the computerized uh, order entry in November um, will uh, allow us to do a, a higher quality of care and more efficiently. And this, you recall, is on our trek with the Cerner Corporation to be uh, in the upper 5% in the country in terms of information technology and how it improves um, health care. And, uh, and this has been, um, this, this, this piece of work here has been very difficult for the physician faculty and the nurses, but um, the mindset about, uh, about information technology and the Cerner Corporation is um, perhaps 180 degrees at our place. So it's been a great partnership and really will uh, allow us to be leaders in this area in improving care. Um, this, I'm going to show you this slide, not because it's so important, but because I want to point out something else. This basically is a slide from uh, Medicare, which shows the percentage of patients under our care who got an MRI scan before they had physical therapy. Uh, and we're doing very well. We're at 29% compared to 36% for the national average. That's good. You're supposed to get, have physical therapy before you get a, uh, a, a, an MRI scan um, in the sense of um, quality and efficiency. That's not such a big deal. What I, what I want to point out to you is that even something as arcane as that is something that uh, Medicare uh, measures and puts up on a website. So um, we have a, a constant dance to try to figure out um, how we're doing in different areas. It's good. It's, it's actually good for healthcare. It's good for uh, patients. It's good for us. But really, um, the scrutiny is, is remarkable uh, in 2010. Um, this is something I told you I'd follow up from last year. Um, this is something we're not so good at, although we're improving uh, rapidly. First two bars are the national and, um, and Missouri uh, ratings for um, what we call patient satisfaction. Would you recommend this hospital? 68% is the standard. Our Columbia Regional Hospital is at 81%, substantially above the national average. University Hospital is at 65%, but that's come up um, a lot over the last couple of years. You, you, um, you, you and the president and others have helped us uh, approve an incentive program for our employees, which is one piece of trying to move that bar up further. Um, a couple of specific patient care things. These are more uh, data from Medicare. This is, um, this is a composite for the quality of surgical care. Uh, you can see we've had a team working on this since about 2006. Um, this last quarter, we hit the top 10th percentile for um, CMS, which is pretty amazing. This one we've been working on longer. We've had a team working on the quality of care we provide for heart attacks um, since about 2003. 
We've been in the 95th, the 100th percentile, and this time we're actually in the top 10 for Medicare. So we're proud about that, but have some ways to go in other areas. I'll talk to you only briefly about the MU Health Care. This is the hospital and clinic strategic plan. We have a nice glossy form of this. If any of you would like to receive it, we'd be happy to send it to you. I want to only focus on one thing. Mr. Ross and his staff have been working hard on this. I want to just look at, you look at the first one, improve the health status of Missourians. You're going to be hearing much more from us about this. This is kind of a bold venture. The idea here is that, as I have characterized it, we do a pretty good job. If you can stumble in past our perimeter, we'll take good care of you, but we'll send you back out to the same place. And we're really now trying to think about what are the antecedents of the diseases that bring people in, what kind of care do they need after they've been in our hospital. And this will require a different skill set and a different set of partners than we've had before. And I applaud Jim for taking that bold move. It's not something that hospitals generally do, frankly. Similarly, the health system, this is now the hospital and clinics and the three schools have completed a strategic, well, actually we're in the early phases of a strategic planning process. I ask them for a number of reasons to focus on these themes, transformational synergy, translating innovation, and health of Missourians. And I did that because I think that's part of our mission, because it dovetails nicely with the strategic plan of the MU campus in general, and because it allows us to deal with the context of health reform as it is now. So the goals, and you'll hear more about this in the future, are to align our research and clinical resources so it's not hire a cardiologist who's not attached to a cardiovascular research program, let's not hire a cardiovascular researcher that doesn't have a clear line of sight to improving the care of patients. And that's consistent with national objectives from the NIH. The fostering healthy communities, this is also part of the hospital strategic plan. That will require us to develop a really different set of skills. It's very exciting, and we've already found a number of both public and private partners that are interested in working with us there. The workforce for a healthy Missouri, we mentioned that. What's our role in what kinds of doctors and nurses will the future need, and how many of them, what specialties, and where are they going to be deployed? That's a big challenge for us, and we have a group working on that. And finally, we need to redesign health care delivery to meet the challenge of health reform, and Mr. Nikas and others are leading that effort. So lots of big stuff. So what are the challenges as we look into the future? I think responding to the increased demands as a result of health care reform, which we're still sorting out, and the fact that people like me are going to be getting sick and needing care, and there's a lot of us, how do we accommodate to what we've traditionally done for that? How do we meet the demand for health professionals? You've heard that we've ramped up our schools to some extent. I've told you that I don't really think that we can ramp up the medical schools output without some major changes. How do we do that? Some of the successes we've had have been because the physicians and the hospital have been much better aligned over the last couple of years. We've been able to do things that we couldn't do before, but we're only 50 percent of the way there, and the next 25 or 50 percent will be very important for us. How do we reform our whole system around the missions that we share with the MU campus? And finally, how do we continue to improve the health of Missourians in innovative ways? And that's my prepared comments, and I'll either take questions now or after Kevin's report, your choice. Maybe comment briefly on the evolution of the hospital advisory board from a governance standpoint. That's something that this board, as we move the hospital responsibility from me, from the president, to the campus, to your position, I think it's important that they hear your perspective. They've heard mine, but I think they ought to hear your perspective on how that's evolved. Thank you. I think it's been a real plus for us. I think we're feeling our way along, as is the board. So this is an advisory board, and we have some members of the advisory board who 
we'd like to um, push forward and give more advice, and that's, of course, why we have them there. Um, I think they've been very helpful in doing a reality check for us. We, we of course, spend um, hours and weeks and months um, on strategic plans and trying to understand things. We think we got it right. We presented to our board, and um, it was slightly deflating to find out that they weren't they, they weren't all that thrilled about it. But but it makes us better. That's what boards are supposed to do. They clearly do understand they're an advisory board to this uh, to to the to us, and and that the board of curators uh, has final authority. Um, that said, in my opinion, this is going to be a better um, situation for you all because we're going to be bringing you issues that I think will have been vetted by a group of people that, um, that, that have spent a lot of time trying to understand our finances and our mission. So I'm, I'm real uh, positive about it. Is that, Gary, that's the kind of things you wanted to? Yeah, it's a diverse group now. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Jim Whitaker from Kansas City, John Short, who runs a large uh, nationwide uh, um, nursing home operation out of St. Louis, uh, three from Columbia, one from Jeff City who chairs hospital board, two, two of the ones from Columbia Jeff City chair hospital boards. Uh, Bill Ricketts from Springfield has chaired a hospital board before Bill's former CEO of a major corporation. So we have a very uh, uh, diverse, uh, I would say aggressively interested board in what we're doing. And they, they accept the advisory role, but they also uh, are holding a task on quality and financial performance. So. Gary, and I'm not suggesting a change, but, you know, having been on this board, you know, I've seen the evolution of, uh, of the reporting and information we get on the hospital and the medical school and that, and I think the new system is better, but, but I would highly encourage uh, the, the opportunity for the board in the future to meet with the advisory board and have a joint session and work together and get reports just on, on an annual basis in Columbia, if in some way just to, because the, the hospital, I think very few people realize what a large component of, of the university's, you know, yeah, dollar volume or, or business, whatever. Uh, and, and I think knowing who the people are on that advisory board and, and knowing they can call the board and, 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 and work with us if, if they would like, uh, would go a long way to, to making sure that we, as a, we are a governing board and we, we, we honor that obligation. A uh, quick comment. Uh, what a, a great report, Dr. Williamson, on so many different fronts. And I think we owe you a uh, thank you for your leadership in all those. And, and probably also uh, to the President for uh, helping put this new structure together that is obviously working much, much better than the structure we uh, had before. So uh, there's a lot of exciting things uh, uh, going on, and, and thank you for your leadership. Things really seem to be clicking right now. Thanks. I appreciate that. I, I, I value the chance to do it. Good morning. Um, a few brief comments on two very quick slides. If you can put up the first one. Thank you. Um, this is a summary of the unaudited financial results as of June 30th, uh, 2010. Uh, and you, you can see in the far left-hand column um, what I probably characterize as an exceptional year with a $62 million bottom line as compared to a $42 million budget over on the right-hand side. Uh, a few comments before we cover the details of that. The 62 million you should see, you you need to know uh, is the results of uh, some one-time items and capital funding, which will be summarized on the second slide. So I'll give you some uh, some of the detail because the operations uh, were not at 62 million; they were at about 38 million. But we'll see the details in a, in a in a moment. Secondly, when you look at the 62, you have to keep in mind. This is the money that is funding the $280 million building program. What Dr. Williamson talked about, the new orthopedic institute moving and opening the Women's and Children's Hospital, uh, the $203 million patient tower. That money is needed to make all that work. So it's, it's very, very important to move those projects forward. Lastly, um, CFOs are very lucky to report at 62 on budgets of 42, but Dr. Williamson and Dr. Churchill and Jim Ross, the chairs, there's a lot of people that really did the heavy lifting and made all that work. And uh, we're very fortunate to have it, but those people are the ones that really 
brought it to reality. As you go down the slide, it's very consistent with the way things were going during the year. Uh, the excess margin is at 10.3 percent. That's um, related directly back to the, the numbers at 62 million. You can see in total we were at 600 million of uh, net revenues for UMHC, and that uh, 62 related to the 600 it cascades down into the numbers that show up in the financial ratios. You go back three, four years ago, we kind of had a target of being a Moody's A-rated as you look at that last column. And, and now you can see in several of the categories, we're beginning to go past that A-rated, where previously we were kind of hoping to get there, which is really good news for the university and for UMHC. If you could turn to the next slide, please. This, this slide gives you a breakout of that 62 million and how much came from operations, which is the first line at 37 million as compared to a budget at 29.2, um, and 8 million ahead of budget um, for, a, uh, for a number that reflects operations. That operations line is what is funding the new tower, funding the Orthopedic Institute as we look at taking operating results and matching it back to facilities that are needed. The next line is the non-operating revenue, and you can see 10.7 million on a budget of 4.3. That was principally the result of a, of a good market pickup on our, on our investments. The balance sheet is marked to market. This year we had an $11 million pickup, which is the principal source of that 6.3 million uh, net variance on the far right hand side. But as you can see, the description is we look at that non operating side to help fund the Ellis Fischel. We needed to come up with the debt to, to fund the 30 million that the, the state had previously tried to fund. And so we look at that non operating as a source for Ellis for Shell. And then as you go down to the capital funding items, you see flowing through there the state funding on MUPC, uh, the state along with transferring the psychiatric center to us on July 1st, committed to a total of $13 million worth of funding for physical improvements to the building. And this shows you that in 2010, we received 10.2 million of that 13 million and, and spent it on improving uh, the facility. And then the last item is the Tiger Institute at 3.8 million. Those are new Cerner systems, new technology. Uh, when Dr. Williamson's talking about EMAR and CPOE and having new technology on the floor for patients and doctors, this is just one year's incremental increase from a January 1st start date on what we picked up this year in new technology from this partnership with Cerner. So when you roll it all together, it totals 62, but this gives you an idea of the one-time items, the market pickup, the funding from the state, et cetera, that rolls together for the 62. And you look back at that 37,301 is really the operating component. Um, Two final comments. Uh, one is relative to MUPC, the psychiatric center. When we took it over, there was some concern as w whether it would operate at a deficit. Now, the numbers are unaudited, but as of last night, they had no new adjustments. Okay, so we're, we're expecting that we're pretty close to completion. But we're at about 2.3 million on the bottom line for the first year of operations in the psychiatric center. Okay, from, and which was a, quite an accomplishment for a first year startup taking over from a pretty tough situation. And uh, the second thing is um, the operation so far this year. For two months, uh, UMHC is at 6.2 million on a budget of 5.1, so we're about a million dollars ahead through the first two months of this fiscal year. So this morning you have an update on the June 30th results the MUPC and two months year to date, um, we're on uh, still pretty firm ground as, as we're approaching another year. With that, I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Uh, this may be more for Nikki, but uh, refresh my memory. When we look at our, our, our bonding capacity, 
Is the hospital being grouped under us, or is it being treated separately? Do, yes. they, have, do they have their own separate bonding capacity, or how do, how do we look at that? Yes. So um, several years ago, we um, incorporated, moved the uh, health system under the university because because we have consolidated financial statements, the um, rating agencies were considering them as part of our rating as well. And so, because they, so we moved from them having a separate rating to incorporating them into our rating, and we're able to save about $11 million. And so they are part of our rating. Okay. So the so new rating we got helps them. And Absolutely. Okay. okay. Are they, now, are you rolling out any bonds in the near future, or, or are you, have you already hit the market? We, no, we, we hit the market when uh, Nikki uh, goes out as a group. I mean, we do not do it any separate, anything separate from her. So it's a direct obligation of the university, mm -hmm. even though yes. we, we, we put it in the health system. It, we, it would have been a direct obligation of the university even yeah. when we issued separately as the health system, okay. still the curators of the University of Missouri. It was just a se treated as a separate credit. Okay. So now we, we have one credit. When we went out last year, we did the first part of the bond financing, most of the bond financing for the new tower, and we've got a small amount in that $110 million that I talked about yesterday, that uh, about $20 million left to, to finance on that uh, facility. And then the $30 million from Ellis to Chef. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. We heard lots of uh, promising reports, and it, it's kind of like the old adage, when things get <coughs> tough, the tough, the tough people get going. And I think we can see that with all of our leaders today. These economic times are difficult, but certainly everybody is working really hard, and we appreciate the good reports that we heard today. Next in our order of business is our consent agenda. Yesterday we removed uh, item number six, so consider that not in the picture. But I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Madam Chair, there's uh, item five on the consent, that's on the consent agenda. It was one that was before the committee yesterday. I have no problems leaving it on the consent agenda. I guess I'm referring to Don and Lane. Uh, that is the particular section that we dealt with yesterday. I have no problem leaving it on. So is there a motion on the floor? Move the consent agenda. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? If not, will you call the vote? Curator Bradley? Yes. Curator Carnahan? Yes. Curator Downing? Yes. Curator Erdman? Yes. Curator Frazier? Yes. Curator Good? Aye. Curator Haggard? Yes. Here's Curator Frazier. Yes. 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 And Curator Wassinger? Yes. Okay. That's a vote of nine to zero. Thank you. Now I'll turn this over to Curator Erdman to address item number six. Thank you. Uh, having served notice yesterday of, of my desire to take the amendment to the collective rules and regulations off of the consent agenda, I would now like to uh, offer some discussion and amend technical amendments to the proposed changes to the collective rules and regulations. Uh, I know everyone had a chance to read these in great detail while, while we were preparing, but I, I, uh, in consultation with the President and the General Counsel, I would like to offer to the Board some technical corrections. The first would be uh, to uh, Collected Rule uh, 10.040. Uh, as everyone knows, we refer to the Chair and Vice Chair as Chair and Vice Chair, not President, and make those changes. The title. Uh, terms of president and vice president in the bold type needs to be changed to comport. So technical, but might as well get it right as long as we're doing it. That would be the first technical amendment I would offer. On 10.050, as everyone knows, the, the actual title of the committee on academic, comma, student, comma, and external affairs is just that. The amended change on 10.050 lists it as academic and student affairs slash external affairs, but, but that's not actually not correct. So I would move that we change them to comport with what the real title of the committee is, which is academic, student, and external affairs. The third 
correction might be arguably not be technical in nature, but I offer it nonetheless for discussion, which is to 10.070. This is the one that I discussed with the general counsel and the president. Both agreed. 10.070 deals with the duties of the general counsel. I would turn your attention to section B, paragraph 5G and 5H. This deals with a requirement, a bureaucratic requirement, that the president provide the general counsel written authority before the general counsel engages in legal activity. I've been told that we do not practice that. We don't require the president to provide written authority for the general counsel to engage in his duties. And it seems to me that the president and the general counsel have agreed that we delete subparagraphs B, 5G, and B, 5H, thereby eliminating the requirement that the president give written authority to the general counsel to conduct his office. I would offer those three amendments for consideration by the board. I'm sure they're wanting to anxiously read that, so we'll give them a minute to do so. We will go ahead and consider this an action item today, so we can go ahead and vote on that with a motion to so approve it. I would make that motion with Warren's correction. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Second. It's been motioned and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, we'll call the roll. Curator Bradley? Yes. Curator Carnahan? Yes. Curator Downing? Yes. Curator Erdman? Yes. Curator Frazier? Yes. Curator Good? Yes. Curator Haggard? Yes. Curator Russell? Yes. Curator Wassinger? Yes. Okay. The motion is passed. The next order of business, then, is the report from Academic Student and External Affairs, Curator Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have one information item. Chancellor Deaton came before the committee yesterday to discuss the U.S. News and World Report rating of the law school on the Columbia campus that had declined some. And he went through the 12 different measures that are used for that ranking. Everyone was, I think, in attendance yesterday, and so we're not going to spend a lot of time rehashing what he had to say. But just a highlight, he pointed out that while those measurements change from year to year, small movements can affect a significant move in the rating, depending on the weighting. One of the more important ratings, the peer group, 25 percent and then 15 percent by the judges and lawyers, that's a total of 40 percent, that we are ranked fairly consistently in the 50s someplace, which is a positive thing. And one of the items that jumped out, at least at me, was the drop in the graduates that were employed after nine months. That dropped from 98 percent to 90 percent, and at the same time it dropped us in ranking from 57th to 150th. And I think that had a fairly significant impact on the overall ranking. Chancellor Deaton went through some enhancements that are being undertaken to address some of those issues with the law school and also concluded with some very positive things that are occurring in the law school right now. So overall, a good report from the Chancellor. That's the extent of our report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. From the Audit Committee, uh, Curator Carnahan. Uh, Madam Chair, we uh, had an Audit Committee me meeting yesterday afternoon. All three members of the Audit Committee were present. Uh, we had three informational items and we made a couple of uh, uh, announcements, so to speak, about uh, the December meeting. Uh, first of all, we had a report from John Tavardek, who is a partner in charge of our account with PricewaterhouseCoopers out of St. Louis regarding our internal audit. Uh, uh, Mr. Tavardek gave a report uh, uh, here, and then we had, and I, and I, only the audit committee got this. That's correct. Uh, okay. The rest of the board just get the summary. Of the they audit. get a summary. Okay. I, you know, and I'm just thinking ahead. It, it might help if we were to post these electronically, so if somebody wanted to take a look at them before the meeting, they would. So they are available to. to and, and I really don't need them in paper. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here anyway. But you know, we could have these electronically just as easily as paper. So uh, save a tree. Uh, uh, second of all. Uh, uh, Nikki gave a report of the performance review of the internal audit. And then finally, uh, we uh, talked about the role, and Nikki gave a report on the role and uh, uh, how the external audit, the scope of the external audit is handled and why, uh, the importance of it and what it, what it does for the university and compliance. And second of all, how the internal audit areas are decided and approved. Uh, John Tavardic is going to come at our meeting in December and give us some more detailed analysis uh, of that process. Uh, uh, Curator Frazier had a request, and I believe that's going to be responded to. And then also, we, uh, we were going to schedule for our December meeting, uh, our meeting with our auditors. I believe the ex external audit report will be complete, so we will combine a meeting with external and internal auditors. It will be the full board. It will be out. Management will not be present. And also, I think the decision was, though, that general counsel will be present for the board. So that we just need to make sure we have ad more than adequate time for that at our meeting. Yeah. Madam Chair, I believe that's the report of the audit committee. Then, where there were no action items. Thank you, John. Uh, the next uh, committee meeting would be compensation and human resources. Curator Erdman. Yes, Madam Chairman. Yesterday, the committee met and considered two information items. Uh, the first was regarding a benefits update, update uh, relevant to our medical plan, our dental plan, and life insurance. Uh, everyone was a participant, so I won't review the detail, but the bad news was we, uh, the, the staff anticipates a 13% increase in the medical plan premiums, uh, which, of course, doesn't come at a great time, but uh, is uh, contemplated for the budget. Uh, the good news was the dental and, and life insurance, vision, and accidental and death insurance plans are not anticipated to have an increase. So uh, with regard to the medical plan, some additional pressure on the budget. The second information item was a lengthy uh, continuation of our ongoing discussion about the retirement plan, pension plan for the University of Missouri employees. Uh, it was announced that there will be uh, additional dialogue with university stakeholders during the month of October. Uh, Vice President Rodriguez and the President are going to conduct those uh, with an eye toward uh, understanding and hearing from the stakeholders of the university and uh, possibly crafting some proposed changes to the plan that will be considered by this committee in November. Uh, and depending on what the committee might do, brought up to the full board possibly in the December meeting. Uh, again, want to emphasize that this is a work in progress, that we take seriously the input that will come from these stakeholder meetings, and uh, look forward to hearing a report from the President and Vice President in November, and we'll bring possibly a recommendation to the full board in December. Chairman, Laura, I, I know we've engaged the faculty, we've engaged the administrators, I've heard from other board members. I don't know if the students have looked at this, and it is a very boring topic when you're 20 years old to be talking about defined benefit. I don't know if they know the significance that you can talk about a cut in appropriation. If this thing goes sour about the level of tuition increases they may be looking at. The student government board or whoever you deal with has not been engaged on this thing. I would strongly recommend they look 
good hard take a good hard look at it because i would like to hear the voice or concerns of the students and it is a very very dry topic mm -hmm. hard to get them engaged in but i would take a very hard look at it if i was the students no i see a direct uh, relationship in the performance of our faculty in the education that we're receiving um, obviously from the retirement packages it depends on who we're recruiting who we're retaining um, in our faculty and really that is our education that we're paying for so, I mean, I'll definitely speak to all the student leaders that are present today and the ones that are, you know, missing, but I'll try and get a voice and an opinion from the student body. Well, we'll look forward to hearing your input at the November meeting of the Compensation Committee. Okay. Uh, Madam Chairman, we had one action item, which was a committee action item and requires no further action by the board, which was to go into executive session to consider certain personnel matters, which we will do upon adjournment of the full board. Concludes my report. Thank you for your report. Um, the next one is Finance Committee, Curator Russell. Thank you, Madam Chair, we had uh, one action item which we disposed of uh, a few moments ago on the consent agenda, but we also had three information items. I think the entire board was involved in, in the discussion, so I won't go through the detail. Um, but uh, the first information item dealt with the investment report on retirement and endowment funds and had a good report there. Uh, probably one of the things you might want to note is that the asset allocation is completed now and uh, uh, the uh, performance over this last fiscal year is, has uh, been good. And uh, uh, John uh, reported, as I already mentioned, that the asset allocation was complete. The second one was the proposed system facilities debt issue, which uh, uh, really took most of our time. Uh, as the board knows, there are, is 110 million uh, projects that have already been approved, uh, but then there is also on the list, uh, just for consideration that the uh, administration is looking through approximately another 250 million in projects, uh, all of which would not be brought back to this board, uh, but perhaps as much as another 190 million that would bring it to a possible $300 million issue. Uh, there are, uh, I think it was $138 million that uh, did not have a dedicated revenue stream. A lot of those were classroom buildings. A lot of the discussion was, was uh, uh, centered around that yesterday. Uh, that is one of the areas I'm sure that, that the campuses and uh, the president will be uh, closely looking at. Uh, we should be planning on what a mid-November probably uh, a special meeting and depending upon the extent of uh, these uh, new projects that have not been approved by the board we could end up with a fairly lengthy meeting uh, but there will be one because there's at least 110 million uh, that we'll have to act on on that issue uh, sometime in mid-November uh, the last one was the financial aid report and really, I think that uh, was an important one for us to hear. Uh, we continue to hear about tuition, and certainly uh, tuition is, uh, has uh, a lot of ramifications on our, our students. But there's also a, a very large uh, allocation of, of financial aid that comes out from our campuses. And, and over the last five years, which I did not realize, we've seen a uh, almost a third, a 32% uh, increase in, in uh, financial aid uh, going to 728 million. So uh, that is a, I think, a good news topic, but something that will even become more important as we look at uh, what may have to happen in, in tuition in not only 2012, but in the years of, in at least the near future. So, uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my report, and we have no action on this. Thank you. Good report. Uh, the next thing in our order is general business of uh, good and welfare of the university. Anybody want to bring up anything? If you don't, I do. I, I was just going to say thank you for everyone who organized this event here in Springfield. I know myself, along with the other students, have really enjoyed stepping out of you know the UN system, and we've actually gotten to intermix with some of the Missouri State uh, students that are here. And I know I'm going to have lunch afterwards, and we were able to go out last night and talk to them and have a nice discussion and kind of see their practices versus our practices. So just wanted to thank you for like letting us have this opportunity. So. Thank you. I too want to thank John 
for getting us here, bringing us here. I hope it's everything that you hoped it would be. I hope we show support to all the people that are supportive of the university. And I well, thank you for your hard work. I, I, I think it was really uh, Cindy and Kathy who did all the work. But I, I think it turned out extremely well. Uh, I appreciate very much. Uh, uh, it went be probably better than we expected. I, I mean, yesterday's lunch ended up with Gary being invited to make a presentation this morning to a group of business people, which I think went over very, very well. I appreciate it, him taking that time to get up early. And so I, I, th I think at least the community down here has a much better appreciation of, of what the university does and how we uh, – how we value our relationship with Southwest. Thank you, and thank you to uh, Cindy, first of all, for all she did to get this organized, and for Kathy for helping her, and also uh, thank you to Cindy for this is her first meeting. I think she's done a really good job to get it all going for us, and look forward to December where you'll have it a little bit easier on one of our campuses. Um, would like to say happy birthday to Betsy today. Happy birthday, Betsy. <laughs> a couple of things I want to mention to you. Um, how many of you get this in the mail? It's from ACTA. This is an excellent little pamphlet. And if you don't have it, I'm going to have Cindy make copies for you. This is Cutting Costs, the Trustee's Guide to Tough Economic Times. I was talking some last night to Nikki. There's great questions in here that we as a board, being responsible, need to be asking. A lot of them I know we do get, but I think it's a great preparation for all of us to see. So let Cindy know if you don't have a copy of this, and we'll get you a copy. Okay? That would be really good. Uh, last but certainly not least is this. <laughs> I don't know if you've all gotten the magazine of the band on the front. But we are certainly proud of the article that's in here on Gary. We're proud of ourselves for bringing him to the university. <laughs> certainly, that's one of the greatest things. And there is an article in this, if you didn't get the book. Can I know. Can we, can we get copies for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is another article I would ask you to read there, and it's a roundtable discussion with uh, a lot of the leaders in higher ed of all the colleges in the area. And it's wonderful, too, and certainly something where you hear the desire and the wish for collaboration, the way we've all got to work together, even learning from one another. Uh, excellent article, I thought. You? Yes. And Gary's uh, article is just a beautiful synopsis of where he's taken us from, from day one to now, uh, the course that he's leading us with and what we hope to have in the future as well as all the problems that we're going to face. So I hope you'll really look at that real well. It was a beautiful article. You know, Madam Chair, I forgot and Laura reminded me of it. Uh, we borrowed an issue tracking system from Rollo's Student Council or Student Government Association and we implemented it and we kind of kind of have put it on the side, but there is out there a system which allows us to keep track of themes or ideas that, that, as a board and then come back and check and calendar it. So my hope is that we, and, and you know, as part of our transparency program, is you know, there's a lot of information about the Board of Curators uh, at, at our website, and so perhaps that might be a good place to, uh, to implement that so any of us can go back and check where we are. But you know, that, that's something that we, we ought to follow up on. Cause that, okay. that was a really good idea, and, and uh, uh, we saw it at a presentation from the Student Government Association at, at uh, uh, Missouri Science and Technology, mm -hmm. and we decided to borrow it for the board, and, and I think we should, we should follow through and continue to use it. So okay. I've forgotten that. Okay. With that, I will call for a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. Second. There's a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Curator Bradley? Yes. Curator Carnahan? Yes. Curator Downey? Yes. Curator Erdman? Yes. Curator Frazier? Yes. Curator Good? Aye. Curator Haggard? Yes. Curator Russell? Yes. And Curator Wassinger? Yes. We'll now go into our executive session, um, and, and we'd like you to go forward first with Steve's report. Are we going to stay here? No, I think we moved to classroom number two. Is that right?
Steve. Judy and I will be doing the press deal, so go ahead and start with Steve.